Good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please make, ask everyone to make sure that their mobile phones are on silent? Uh, no apologies have been received for the meeting, so we'll move straight into agenda item one, which is a decision on taking business in private. The committee is asked to consider taking item four in private relating to the evidence heard to date on the salmon farming in Scotland inquiry. Are members agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, we'll move on to agenda item two, which is crofting legislation. And I would invite members to declare any relevant interest to, and I think we ought to include farming as well as crofting. So I'm going to make a declaration that I have an interest in, in a farming partnership. Does anyone else wish to make a declaration? Peter? Well, on that basis, convener, I will make the same similar declaration that I am involved in the farming business as well. Stuart? Uh, I've got a very small registered agricultural holding, which if it was in the crofting counties would be crofting. It isn't. Okay. Thank you. On that basis, uh, we're going to move forward into this evidence session, which will explore the Scottish Government's proposal on crofting legislation reform. I'd like to welcome from the Scottish Government, Government Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity, Michael O'Neill, the crofting <coughs> bill team leader, Gordon Jackson, Head of Agricultural Development and Crofting, and Ian Davidson, the Head of the Agricultural Policy Division. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a short opening statement uh, regarding crofting legislation? Yes, thank you, Convener. Good morning, everybody. I um, most agree that the current crofting legislation is complex and lacking in transparency, having been developed on a piecemeal basis uh, uh, for over uh, 130 years. The consultation was launched last August, seeking views from stakeholders on the Scottish Government's crofting policy the potential form that new crofting legislation could take and priorities for legislative change. During the three-month consultation period, my officials had a series of 21 meetings uh, with the public and interested stakeholder groups, hearing directly from over 300 individuals across the crofting counties. The consultation closed in late November last year with 122 responses from individuals and organisations. The respon responses were independently analysed and a report on that analysis was published in mid-March. A wide and diverse range of views were expressed and this highlighted the scale of the challenge ahead. The analysis highlighted almost equal proportions of support for new crofting legislation versus making changes to existing legislation and restating or consolidating law. Uh, consequently, there does not appear to be a consensus that would allow me to decide on specific pieces of legislative reform. Following the publication of the analysis report, I met with the cross-party group in Crofting to outline how I wish to take matters forward and to hear members of that group and also MSP's views. I explained that I'm proposing a two-phase approach to legislative reform, with a first phase in the shorter term uh, leading to a bill in this parliamentary session. This first phase will focus on delivering changes which carry widespread support and result in practical, everyday improvements to the lives of crofters and the legislative procedures they follow. Um, I'm keen to involve and engage MSPs, particularly those with crofting interests, to ensure that their ideas and proposals can be considered and taken forward in legislation. The second phase is longer term work where I've asked my officials to continue to give consideration to a fundamental review of crofting legislation. This will aim to provide a solution to some of the more complex and challenging issues facing crofting and what they might mean for how legislation is developed in future. This work will begin now, but will be for a future parliament to deliver. I'm very pleased to say that this work is already underway. A crofting bill group has been established to involve stakeholder organisations in the development of the proposals for a bill and to consider the longer term issues. I understand the first meeting of this group has taken place and was positive and constructive. I am also keen to use further non-legislative means to make changes to help to further improve the sustainability of crofting and encourage new entrants. These will include the National Development Plan for Crofting and the New Entrance Scheme that will directly benefit crofters without the need to wait for legislative change. It's also not just within crofting that I see opportunities to enhance provision. I'm keen to encourage more woodland crofts 
through the National Forest Estate and to ensure that crofting communities benefit from our ambitions for a low carbon economy and commitment to provide all homes and businesses with access to superfast broadband. The approach I'm taking forward is pragmatic and focused on delivering a future for crofting in 21st century Scotland. Uh, I hope that these opening remarks are helpful. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And the first questions today come from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, panel. Cabinet Secretary, you talked about the consultation, and I'd like to start off by asking you a couple of questions about that. Um, of the 122 responses that were submitted, 74% of those were from individuals. Do you feel that the responses were satisfactory, and do you think that those most affected by the changes had a chance to adequately feed into the consultation? And, of course, that includes the 21 meetings as well that you also held with face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, well, I think I do. A lot of work was put into the, the consultation. The information was sent to a wide group of those who have an interest. I have the, the, the list here. I, I won't read it out for sake of time, but I can share it with the committee. Um, the, the build team actually held a series of 21 public and private meetings um, and uh, I think Mr O'Neill might be able to share the benefit of his experience because I think he attended 19 out of the 21. Um, but I do think that it was a very wide consultation. There have been previous ones, of course, uh, and it allowed us to get a very wide range of views, but also to establish that there didn't appear to be a majority view for any uh, particular approach. I don't know if Mr O'Neill might want to share some of the substantial experience that he developed. Yes, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. When we went round the country, we, we had over 300 people attend the, the meetings across the, the crofting areas um, and, and with um, interested stakeholder groups, and that did cover a very wide range of uh, interests, be it individual crofters to st stakeholder representatives. And we made sure that we had copies of information there for them to be able to sort of take away with them and indeed in, in certain places we, we, we left copies of the, uh, the consultation document um, and the response forms so that people could get, get back to us with um, responses to uh, the consultation questions. So uh, we, we did go very, very, very wide in terms of the, um, the coverage of um, the the pe people we wanted to hear from. And Cabinet Secretary, what was the response from the cross-party group on crofting when you put the proposals to them? Um, well, I don't know if it would be fair to say that the group as such provided a particular response, um, but I thought that it, it was good to engage with that group, and indeed many of you here were there. Um, I think it's relevant to say that since... Um, my appearance before the stakeholder group, there has been a number of reactions from key people involved, and they, they have been, I think, as far as I'm aware, broadly positive. For example, the NFUS has backed our approach and they issued a statement to that effect. Um, the Scottish Crofting Federation said, we are pleased the Cabinet Secretary has announced a positive way forward. This is good news for crofting. Um, Brian Inkster, um, a lawyer who specialises in this, said that the, the approach seems eminently sensible. They've recognised the complexities involved and, all, and that all that needs to be sorted probably can't be easily sorted in just one parliamentary term. So, you know, I appreciate that governments can always be criticised from various different perspectives for not being bold enough or, or, or uh, being too bold, but the response broadly to answer the question seems to be supportive from the key people involved. And I'm very keen to try to maintain a kind of consensual approach with stakeholders and indeed to work closely with individual MSPs as we go forward with our, our plan. But I think a two-phased approach, as far as legislation is concerned, has, has attracted some support. But the non-legislative approach with the National Development Plan, the young entrants, and of course the work that we've already been doing with, with grants, for example, which I can share with the members if, if that's of interest, uh, we'll continue with that non-legislative approach because, after all, Law is just words on a page. It doesn't, of itself, provide transformation to people's lives. I'm, I'm going to bring Kate Forbes in and then Stuart Stevenson and then come back to Gail Ross. So, Kate. Just a very brief question about um, the, those that uh, responded to the consultation. You said 74% were individual members of the public. Were most of them active crofters or were they representing other interests? 
I'll, I'll ask you. Um, I can't give you precise figures on the, the number of crofting responses we had, but it was clear from the responses that sort of a number of people were crofters. There was um, a number of people who have an interest in crofting that not necessarily crof crofting themselves, but I would, I would say the, sort of the, the bulk of the people that attended the public meetings um, certainly were people who were crofters and uh, had, had that direct interest in it. I think Mr O'Neill was to be commended for um, well and truly getting out of St Andrew's House and attending 19 of the 21 meetings uh, around the Crofting Counties himself. I think that was uh, a, a, a shining example to some of his colleagues. I'm, I'm sure a, a, a delightful trip around the Crofting Counties would be welcomed by all. Stuart. Um, the, the Minister of the Cabinet said she's just used the phrase crofting counties. Now, of course, in the original legislation, by a single vote, the area I represent was excluded from being crofting county. And therefore, and I've had no approaches, let me just preface my remark by saying that, it, was any evidence uh, brought forward by uh, people who were consulted uh, about what the proper boundaries for crofting should be? In other words, should it be in all Scotland? because it's actually an activity rather than something that one would naturally think is defined by uh, simply geographical boundaries. And did the consultation make it easy for that to emerge? Because it's all very well going around the Crofting Counties, but there might be views elsewhere that might bring that forward. Clearly that wouldn't be for the phase one bill that the cabinet secretary is described, but might be for the later one. I think if memory serves me correct, the 1886 Act extended to eight crofting counties. As always, I'm indebted to Mr Stevenson's his historical knowledge. I didn't know that his area was excluded by one vote, although he is very nearly a crofter himself, given <laughs> his declaration earlier. But I don't know whether Mr O'Neill can enlighten us on this in, question. In terms of the consultation responses themselves, there was... There was <coughs> little in terms of responses looking for expanding the boundaries. However, we have some of the meetings, uh, particularly one in Vanessa, there, there was somebody there saying that uh, possibly it, it, there should be an extension of crofting across all of Scotland. And I, I think there, there might actually have been one response that, that said something similar to that. That could well have been that, that particular person. I don't, I don't know. But um, it, there wasn't a great call for it. And in terms of the... Um, consultation document itself, whilst we might not have asked a specific question in relation to that issue, what we had made very clear was if there was anything that people wanted to add in, in terms of comments to uh, the, the, the questions that had been asked, or indeed any other question they wished to raise, then they were more than um, welcome to raise those with us, and we, we, we didn't receive much, much in the way of additional information from that. On that issue. I'm it's going to come back. It's a bit late to extend the crofting counties beyond the eight, and I imagine that, that uh, there would be legal issues, not least under ECHR, uh, about that. But, uh, a, but it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I'm going to come back to Gail Ross before we move on to the next question. Yes, uh, can I also add my thanks to uh, the Bill team getting out of Edinburgh? I'm sure you enjoyed your 19 meetings. Um, just for the record, were there any respondents to the consultation that wanted to see no change? Yes, um, um, it, it depends how you, in terms of no change, 8% of the respondents actually said could you just consolidate and that was option one, existing legislation. And there was at least one individual who came in and said um, we, we don't need to change the legislation. Um, but in terms of the 122, that there were relatively few. Um, and there were, there were others that said, of course, we don't need crofting legislation. It should be just linked into agricultural legislation with appropriate secondary legislation. But uh, there was no, 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 no majority. It was actually a very, very small number of people who wanted no change. So, Thank you. Sorry, can I just clarify, because I'm not sure I heard you correctly. I think, I think I'm, I'm right in saying you said 18%. 8% were said. 80? 8. 8%. 8%. 8 for option one. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we clarified that, because I didn't quite hear that. Right, I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, Rich Love. Good morning, panel, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, as you, as you have said, there's been several reforms and amendments to the Crofting Act since 1886. October 2013, the Crofting Law Sump Group was established. Its final report was published in November 2014. The Sump Report identified 57 issues 
with crofting law, which should be taken forward in a crofting bill. Of these, it identifies 17 high priority propositions. Can I therefore ask you, Cabinet Secretary, what issues are likely to be addressed in the bill proposed for this session? Well, the, the crofting bill group, which I mentioned has been formed, has already, has already met, has considered this. Um, and, you know, I, I should acknowledge that we recognise the value of the Shucksmith report and we also recognise the huge amount of work that's gone into delivering the crofting law SUMP, which is um, a somewhat unfairly derogatory term, which uh, is actually a valuable document and identifies a series of measures. It doesn't in itself actually amount to a series of prescriptive policy solutions. Some of its um, points, uh, 50 or 60 or so points, identify issues rather than provide solutions. Um, we certainly want to try to um, identify in the first um, phase those items of, of improvement in legislation, for example, um, removing the somewhat rigid requirement of newspaper advertisement, which brings with it unnecessary expense, some of the prescriptive deadlines to which the Commission must adhere and which cause practical difficulties in connection with their work. Um, we want to identify those measures which can improve and rectify errors and omissions and which cause practical difficulties, mindful of the fact that I think the committee did ask us to, to do exactly uh, that as one, in one of its recommendations. Um, so phase one would uh, uh, deal with, um, uh, with uh, various of the kind of simpler issues. And I think it would also be correct to say that phase one should not try to identify try to address some of the more complex issues, for example, regarding um, succession or assignation. Uh, and I think it would be helpful for the group not only to identify those issues that the bill should deal with, but also those that the bill should not really deal with and it would be better dealing with in phase two. Uh, that's my personal view and, and uh, uh, of course, I'm interested in what the, what the uh, committee members say. I don't know if, Michael, would you like to add anything about what we shall try to deal with in phase one. I'll, I'll add something very, very briefly, Cabinet Secretary. I don't know if this is going to answer possibly another question later on in the, the meeting as well, but for your information, we have set and established a, a crofting bill group to start looking at issues for phase one, and we have a list based uh, predominantly on the sump, but because that's where lots of the issues in relation to crofting legislation are found, but we've augmented it with other things from the the, uh, the consultation, um, and we have, we have a list that we'll, we'll be putting onto the internet, making public to show how, how we're coming to the sort of decisions in terms of what's included in phase one. And there was a very um, good first meeting on the 25th of April, and that stakeholders there were engaging very, very, very much in terms of the discussion about what should, should or shouldn't be in that that phase one, um, and hopefully that that will ensure we get sort of buying to the process as we move forward with the legislation. And or to uh, another um, uh, member of the committee to ask you uh, other items. Can I ask, and, and I compliment you on the steady approach that you are uh, looking at doing. Um, phase one will be this session of Parliament. Phase two when? Our, our our intention is to bring forward a bill before the, the end of this parliamentary session. Um, phase two would be a legacy issue for the next parliament. However, um, I think it's important to stress that uh, I, um, I, I intend to, to ask my officials to do work now so that we can try to provide a legacy to the next session of parliament rather than a blank canvas. Thank you. John, would you like to, to come in and push that a little bit harder? Or? <coughs> Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Panel. Just a bit further on that, then, Cabinet Secretary, can you confirm what consultation there will be in on the specific work that you're doing now? For instance, will you publish a draft bill? Um, I think there's... Uh, I'm attracted by the idea of publishing a draft bill. Um, uh, no decision has yet been made, and I think these are ones that have to be taken by the Cabinet in the context of our other legislative priorities. But I think the approach that I'm taking... Um, would benefit uh, from having as much clarity as possible in phase one, uh, and therefore the publication of a draft bill would have considerable merits. Um, but we'll give that further thought and discuss it with the crofting bill group, and of course we will keep the committee closely advised. Thank you. And, and just a bit further on the issue of time frame that uh, 
Mr Lyle referred to there. Um, what sort of time frame would we be talking about for that, Cabinet Secretary? Please. Well, we, we, I, I don't wish to put a, a firm time scale uh, on matters at the moment. Uh, after all, it took 140 years from the Battle of Culloden to secure crofting reform. Uh, so we, will, we shall, however, uh, bring forward um, our proposals uh, with the uh, <coughs> firm intention to legislate on phase one before the end of this parliamentary session. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I just ask you on that? One of the recommendations of the committee report uh, when we did our inquiry into crofting, that there would be sufficient time uh, to allow the Parliament to consider all the legislation, and it wasn't one of those bills that appeared just before the end of the session. Could you confirm that what you are saying is there will be time, because it is very important, and I believe this committee accepts, it's very important to get this right. Um, it has been telegraphed yeah. before the election that there would be crofting legislation in this term. Could I just confirm that there is going to be proper consultation and a proper time scale? So I'd like to push you a wee bit on when you see that bill coming forward to allow all of the Parliament to consider this. Well, the decision and timing of the bill will obviously be taken by Cabinet in the context of the Scottish Government's other legislative uh, priorities, and a firmer timescale will become clearer as the work progresses. I mean, I do think uh, that the important thing with legislation is that the, we do take sufficient time to get the legislation right. And I do note, actually, that Mr Inkster, whom I quoted earlier, said um, as follows, he said, splitting reform over two parliamentary terms should allow a comprehensive and considered approach to crofting reform, unlike the rushed approach that led to the Crofting Reform Scotland Act 2010. That rushed approach created many of the problems requiring to be resolved today. You want to come in there? I, I, I just wondered, where the, we've got a bill team manager here which indicates some level of commitment. Is that the correct title? I'm Sorry. Leader. I'm, I'm not leader. leader. But, you only have but a we've bill got team somebody. Manager once you have a bill, you know, yeah. the bill is yeah, first, then. I beg your pardon. But I just wanted to. Manager second. <laughs> I just wanted to establish we've, we've put someone in charge of a prospective bill. When was that appointment made? No, no, no. I, I, I mean, I've asked Mr. O'Neill ah. to, to deal with this work and lead on that work, and that's what he's doing. I mean, you know, the formal business of appointment of bill team managers is. That's right. Is, is one that we we, we haven't yet uh, we haven't yet reached. Okay. Um, I'm not sure we're going to get much further on that, so I'm going to push forward uh, with the next question, which is Mike Rumbles. <coughs> Thank you, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, <coughs> in your opening statement, you uh, gave a very comprehensive uh, outline of what's been happening from the, from your perspective of the government. Uh, your consultation, 122 responses, 21 public meetings. You, you mentioned the cross-party group. Um, you didn't mention the fact that this committee has undergone an inquiry in, into crofting and that uh, we produced the report. And um, one of our major recommendations, which we all agreed on, was that in our report following our inquiry on crofting law reform, our committee said, and I quote, there should be a move away from a piecemeal approach to crofting legislation and that the bill should be comprehensive. In other words... As a result of our inquiry into the whole process, we did it to uh, engage, engage what, identify what the issues were so that of course, we could increase our own knowledge, but also to feed into to you and the, 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 to influence the way that you might approach this bill. Now, it strikes me, I haven't had time to discuss it with, with the rest of colleagues, but it's certainly just, um, it appears to me that, in fact, you're doing the opposite. You're, you're producing a bill which is not going to be a comprehensive bill, and, in fact, you've just said... And you're talking about phase one, and therefore I assume there's a phase two, but actually it's a, it's a legacy for, the, for, for a future government and a future parliament. So what it seems to me from your responses is that you're actually doing the opposite of what this committee recommended. I just wondered what your thoughts were. Um, well, I, I do agree that the, the piecemeal approach is, is not desirable, but I disagree that the approach I've set out could be characterised as a piecemeal approach. I think it's a strategic approach, and the quotes that I've read out from Mr Inkster, for example, from the Crofting Federation of the NFUS, would seem to recognise that we are taking a strategic approach to deal with things in, in stages that are likely to be efficacious, that are likely to work. 
I, of course, I respect the work the committee did, but I felt it to, uh, and indeed precisely because the committee asked me to, we, we then proceeded with the, the work that we've done, uh, as well as the manifesto commitment. And the point I want to make is that, you know, I was, I was very keen to reach out to the people of Scotland to get their views. And I think I have demonstrated, and Mr O'Neill has done the, most of the legwork here, that we did reach out to the people and they spoke and they said that they did not want to have, if you like, uh, the fundamental reform approach. There was no clear majority. And therefore, we do listen to the people. And just I, I stumbled across a quotation from the Highland Land League, which was uh, its slogan convener, uh, which amply sums it up, uh, because their slogan was that the people are mightier than a lord. So I'm sure, convener, that there's a lot that would commend that slogan even today. Uh, and the people spoke through the consultation, and we are simply being guided by the people in this regard. Yes, I mean, we also had a consultation, and we were guided by the people in the same way as that you have, but we've come to completely the opposite conclusion, it seems to me. Um, could you outline um, how you've taken our other recommendations, if at all, any of them, uh, forward? Well, there are several recommendations that might be more fruitful to deal with them each in turn, if the committee... It wishes, but you know, I've had due regard to all the, the recommendations, for example, to try to make improvements, practical improvements in the daily life of crofters, and, and that's why, convener, you know, since 2007, we've devoted, I think, £60 million to extending 800 grants to 800 families to secure their future on crofts, and you know, that's why, in respect of the CAG scheme. Uh, we've seen 4,000 applications, £12 million, or so the cattle improvement scheme, £3 million. So in terms of helping people in their daily lives and the practical issues, and that was one of the committee's recommendations, uh, I, don't think we, uh, I don't think we're falling short. Can we leave it to you? No, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I'd just like to clarify in my mind that 43% of the respondees said that they wanted a clean slate which is a majority of people given the choice of options. If you add all the options together, or the other responses to the other options together, it comes up to more than 43%, but if you, by 1%. 43% uh, said they wanted a clean slate, Cabinet Secretary, which was the impression that we got, I believe, on the committee, that there was a feeling that a clean slate and not a piecemeal approach was the way forward. Now, why, why don't we take, why are you not taking the 43%? Why are you adding all the other responses to say that you don't have a clear majority? There were a majority of respondents to the question, simple question, wanted a clean slate. I just need to understand that. I'm struggling on that, Cabinet Secretary. Well, what I said was there, was there was no clear majority for a particular approach. And, you know, with respect, 43% uh, uh, is not a majority. Uh, so it's, it's not... Uh, it's 57% uh, did not, by definition, support that approach. Uh, and uh, moreover, I'm heartened. I, I mean, I appreciate there's many different approaches. I've already said that. But, you know, I go back to the fact, convener, and correct, you can tell me if, if I've missed out anybody. But, you know, the key people involved here, the stakeholder group, and subsequently the stakeholders have commended the approach we're taking. So I'm heartened by that. And I... Uh, uh, and, of course, debate and discussion is, uh, is always appreciated. But I, I'm heartened by the initial response to our approach. Uh, and I think the kind of suggestion that Mr Finney made of continuing to consult to come forward with a draft bill would be consistent with that approach to try to continue to demonstrate that what we propose to do has broadly the consent of the people, not just a minority of the people. Uh, Peter, do you want to try? Yeah, I, I mean, I... Uh, the convener stole my thunder a bit because I was going to quote the 43% part of the consultation as well. And I mean, that, although it, it doesn't make a majority, it was the, it was the most favoured uh, way forward by those that were consulted. And it appears, you know, the, the, my problem is I, I certainly, I made my, my thoughts clear at the time of the committee that I favoured a clean sheet approach. Now, I don't, I don't I accept that not everyone in the committee had the same opinion, but the committee did say that we didn't want a piecemeal approach. And I, I for, my, my, for my 
from my point of view, I think this is disappointing because it looks a wee bit like tinkering around the edges, which is exactly why we've re we have such a complex set of laws governing crofting right now. I mean, it's been tinkered around the edges so many times that we end up with a, a set of laws that virtually nobody understands. It, little, you know, the, the, even the lawyers can hardly understand, let alone the, the average crofter. So I'm disappointed this seems to be another attempt to think around the edges, and I think we should have been much more robust. So, you know, I, I say that, and I just ask what, what format the bill will take. Um, well, the bill will take form of any parliamentary bill. It will set out a proposed set of legislative uh, proposals. But with respect, I don't agree that, uh, this, uh, with the criticism that's made, and uh, I think the, the approach we have taken seems to command a fair amount of support. Um, however, I'm keen that we give a full answer to the committee, so maybe Mr O'Neill could add his comments because he's been absolutely closely involved with every part of it. Yes, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. In, in looking at the way forward in, in all of this, we had the options set out in the, the consultation document from one end of the spectrum, having a consolidation right through to a clean sheet at the other end. And in options two and three, whilst they were they were different, they were, they were closer together on the spectrum of legislative approach we could take, um, and really did involve very similar things in terms of changing existing legislation, and then, in one case, having a second bill to consolidate thereafter, that's option two, and in terms of option three, it was then trying to reduce the numbers of pieces of legislation, that, as well as change the, the existing legislation at the same time. But they were doing very, very similar things. They weren't obviously going to a, to a clean sheet. And then when you look at those two together, 42% of respondents were saying, go down and change existing legislation if you can. And the 43% said, let's, let's have a clean sheet. So it made the decision a very, very fine one. Um, and in terms of some of the consultation responses, those who were in favour of option for the clean sheet. And they're saying reaching consensus on a new bill could be difficult and time consuming, and that may affect the ability to deliver this parliament. But equally, <laughs> others who are supporting option three and tearing, tidying up legislation, um, it would make changes that would not necessarily resolve all out outstanding issues, and there could be a call for further legislation in the future. So, to a certain extent, it was, it was difficult to get away out in terms of, other than going and saying, look, let's, let's try and solve some of the key issues that we can now that do garner lots of support, widespread support, and then looking at these more difficult um, issues that are quite hard to achieve consensus because the evidence from the, the consultation was really saying there's, there's potentially opposing opinions, contradictory opinions in certain cases, that really do need to be bottomed out before we could make more fundamental change. Otherwise, we'll end up potentially back, back where we started with people being un unhappy with the legislation. The so that was some of the background to sort of why we've... Yeah, I, I, I get all that, and I do understand that a clean sheet would, would, be a, would be a difficult piece of work and a huge piece of work. But do you accept my premise that the, one of the reasons we are in such a complex situation is precisely what we've done in the past. We've, we've tinkered around the edges, we've, we've made small changes, we've, and we've built law on top of law until we get a situation that nobody can understand the, the, the Crofton law, unless you've, you've got a degree in law, and even then you're struggling. In terms of what we're trying to do in phase one, it's, it's then looking at things that can actually start making changes that make lives on the ground for Crofters more straightforward as soon as we can. Rather than going that's that's what everybody has said in the past. This is, what, this is a design to make life a bit more straightforward. And what we've ended up with was a much more complex set of rules. So, I mean, I understand your, your, your well-meaning in what you say, but I think everybody that's had a go at this in the past would also say they were well-meaning. And it, it, it's absolutely ended up in a dog's breakfast that nobody can, can find their way through. That does really seem to be an unduly negative prognosis. I mean, we have had the welcome from the Crofting Federation, from the NAFUS, from a distinguished lawyer, Brian Ingster, who I think has no difficulty in understanding interpreting crofting law and advising clients thereon. So um, I think we should be a bit more positive about this. There is a desire to go ahead to, to deal with the, the phase one. 
as established in principle at least, and I for one want to try to build on that positivity and take it forward. Can I, can I just ask a I'm going to bring Jamie Green in and then Mike Rumble. So, Jamie, do you want to come in? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I step in at this stage because I, I believe, uh, according to the plan, my colleagues are going to talk about phase two uh, of, uh, of the Cabinet Secretary's comments. But I think before we move on to phase two, uh, I just want to recap on something. Um, phase two is outside of the parameters of this committee, this parliament, this government. So there are many great unknowns in terms of what may happen in future parliaments and governments. I'm interested in what this committee does and what this parliament does and what this government is doing. So I would like to focus on the phase one bill for a second. Uh, before we move on to phase two, I will go into this next discussion no further in the know as to what this current bill will contain, what it will do, what it will achieve, what may or may not be in it. If it's not piecemeal, what is it? Well, it's, it's a series of measures, some of which I've already mentioned. I assume Mr Green was listening earlier on. I gave some examples, I think, to Mr Lyle. So I've already mentioned some of them, but they're designed to be those that could be implemented relatively easily, that are less controversial. Uh, and uh, the work has been taken forward in a group of ex by a group of experts with the Bill Group. But, um, but maybe Mr Neil could supplement the answer I gave to Mr Lyle previously to answer Mr Green's question about the content of... <coughs> of phase one, mindful that we have to prepare this and then, con and then possibly consult on it, as, as Mr Finney suggested. No, hold on, oh, sorry, Mike, I'm, I'm going to <laughs> Michael Mike, first. Just Michael. Okay, well, if, if you think he can answer the same together, well, Mike, why don't you come in and then maybe the, the, the point Michael, you can The I was going to make in. was, fa we keep talking about hearing phase one and phase two, there is no phase two, because this is only phase one, there isn't a phase two, there's no way. The point I, I was going to ask, which you could link in with, with Jamie Green's point, is that we're 40% through, this week, we're 40% through this parliamentary session. We've got two years, and we've only got three years left. The point is, and we haven't even got a bill before us. So Jamie was asking about this piecemeal approach. It strikes me that unless a bill comes forward fairly quickly, we're not going to have the time to deal with this comprehensively. So it is a piecemeal approach, isn't it? No, I don't think I agree with that, and I think it's a strategic approach. And, and nothing has prevents this committee from expressing uh, views about what future law reform uh, should, should be. But I think it would be helpful if Mr O'Neill could supplement to, to answer Mr Green's question, the, the answer I gave earlier, in which I did give uh, a couple of examples of specific items that will be in the proposed draft bill. Give a, a, a list of areas that you think you're going to be delving into ra rather than going through each of them in great detail well, because I fear we may be short on time. Possibly it, it might be something I can also provide to the committee after if this is a list. Well, maybe I think you should read them out now if, if possible. Okay, right, okay. Um, one of the issues that we're looking at is uh, joint tenancies. Um, this is a, something that came out of the Women Agriculture Report because at the moment. It seems to be crafting legislation means you can only have a tenancy in one name, and that in, in these times, stakeholders are saying doesn't seem to be the right thing to have. So we can look at changing legislation there because that then brings crafting in, into line with other parts of um, other tenancies and other, other types of agreements like that. Um, there's something called minor reorganisation of a croft, and that would allow the croft, giving the crofting commission powers to sort out some quite tricky situations whereby you have part owners of crofts wanting to do one thing and a, a, a particular owner saying they can't allow the, their neighbours to do whatever it is with their, their part of the croft. Um, and so it's looking at, again, allowing crofters greater... Um, freedom in terms of the land that, that they are managing. Um, that, that's just one of those things. There's, there's four or five issues in that. Um, there's something in terms of the meaning of owner-occupiers as well. There's um, a number of owner-occupiers that bought, that bought their crofts in the 19, well, prior to 1955, when there was no crofting legislation as such, and now they find themselves in terms of current um, legislation. Um, landlords of vacant crofts because they, they, they were never actually installed as a crofter. So I think there's something like 975 of these cases and that we could then actually resolve 
issues for those, those particular crofters if, if we can get that sort of uh, legislation changed. Um, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned registration requirement. That's um, in terms of the, the, the advertising and the, the process of uh, first registering your, your croft. Um, there's enforcement of duties when a, a croft is sublet, and should that be on the tenant, or should it be on the owner occupier, or the, the tenant themselves who's actually let the croft out. Um, there's the requirement for having annual notices from uh, crofters, and that's something that's handled every year. It's quite a resource-intensive process for the crofting commission, and also a requirement placed on crofters that obviously takes up their time yearly, so we, we can look at seeing whether that has to be done every year. Um, there was the Grazing Committee's duty to report, which is a, a recommendation this, this committee put in its report, um, and it's really re reporting on neighbouring crofts, and it's proved quite a, a difficult one for Grazing Committee clerks to deal with, and we heard that on a number of um, instances throughout the, the consultation period. And so we, we can look to see how that particular legislation might be refined to, to ease that sort of burden. We can look at deemed crofts, and again, I think the, the committee heard evidence uh, from the Crofting Commission on deemed crofts, and that's where the, the common grazing shares have become detached from the tenanted croft, and that, and that creates a number of problems. We think there may be a way to actually stop creating deemed crofts with it, with changes to existing legislation, but trying to relink them is quite a complex system and would require a lot of thought and discussion with, with stakeholders and crofters to work out what, what the effects of relinking would be. So that's possibly a phase two issue, but certainly trying not to create any more deemed crofts, we can, we can look at that in, in phase one. Um, there's you know, notice of first, sorry, I've dealt with that one. There's uh, change to, um, whether decisions the Crofting Commission makes have to be adjudicated by the Land Court or whether there, there can be something in the Crofting Commission that shows that more independent. Again, it's taking decisions that then don't require resources to be spent at, in uh, the land, you know, land Court, which, which can be expensive in terms of judicial, uh, judicial resources. Um, right. Uh -huh. And that's very helpful. List. There's, 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 could, could, could I just the list is thir there's, there's 30. Yeah, five I appreciate plus on the list. I, I, I appreciate that. But, yeah. it, Michael, I think that's why I was I was concerned that you were. I really wanted the headline things, but maybe if you could you submit that to the committee, we could have a look at that afterwards. That'd be very helpful yeah. through the clerks, please. Was, Jane. Jane. Yeah, I mean, the only point I was going to make, uh, Mr. O'Neill, is it, uh, will, will the important uh, high priority. Uh, recommendations of the SUMP report, the 17 high priority, will they be addressed in the phase one bill or will some of those elements be? Some of them will be. Some of the high priority issues in the SUMP were ones they recognised weren't easy to deliver and therefore when we were looking at drawing up this list for phase one, we took that list and tried to match up things that were high priority and something we could sensibly deliver, whereas things that may be contentious or require quite a lot of work because the, the legislation is so complicated around those issues and that might need to go into to phase two but okay. uh, that, the, 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 the starting point was as many of the high priority issues in that list as, as we could. So that's the short answer and I hope Mr yeah. Green is happy with it. As, as this bill group goes working and, or throughout its business we will be putting papers and information on a web page and we can again provide that mm -hmm. address to uh, members of this committee. We'll have um, contact details for the bill team on that so if people have suggestions about what they think may be included because the stakeholders are away considering this list at the moment see if there's anything they feel that might be able to go into this so it's not it's not fully set in stone but there are a number of things there that we can work on and that's what this bill group is doing move to the next question uh kate Phillips. Thank you, and, uh, this question will look at phase two with apologies to Jamie Green. <laughs> um, so in terms of the, the content of phase two, what is the current status of the government work, government's work on the proposed national development plan for crofting, which I understand was um, included in the programme for government um, 
at the start of this uh, this term. Can I get the bit of a briefing? Um, well, the uh, the programme for government suggested that uh, work should begin on a national development plan, uh, and since then we we have been taking that <coughs> work forward. This will form a critical part of support uh, the Scottish Government will offer to crofters and crofting communities uh, because we believe it's important that crofts are utilised in the best possible way to, to contribute to the rural economy and sustainable uh, communities. Um, the stakeholder engagement process began in 2016 and they included the Foundation, the NFU, HIE, the Commission and SLE, and they have been giving consideration to what recommendations they wish to make to the Scottish Government for inclusion in the plan. This has resulted in a number of draft priority papers, including a development paper, which um, I, I, we obviously will be working on and looking to bring forward uh, in due course. Um, the plan will contain such things as an updated clear crofting policy details of a new entrance scheme, a further development's promotional role for the Crofting Commission, which will incorporate better signposting of what support is available for crofters, a crofting pack for new entrants, and common grazings guidance. And indeed, the, the Commission is working on a template for that very controversial issue. Um, and we are committed to drafting the Crofting Development Plan uh, and to consult key stakeholders uh, the, thereafter. So it's important work, but you know, I, I do stress that that's not stopping us from helping uh, crofters, crofting with uh, crofting grants, with the Bull Stud Scheme, uh, and uh, a, with the CAGS grant support. So is it, I mean, obviously one of the biggest complaints I hear in my constituency is about the, the lack of clarity and the fact that there is often um, sources of support for crofters that they're unaware of. And so presumably, will this development plan uh, identify sources of support and also will it have some sort of strategic targets in terms of how we improve our support for crofters? Uh, yes, it will aim to, to do that. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, as Kate Forbes knows very well, the Hyslas Enterprise is distinctive in that it has a social obligation in its remit and it takes that very seriously. But, but of course, the Business Gateway deals with the with advice at the uh, at the kind of level of, of uh, individual small businesses, um, the Crofting Commission has a general duty to promote crofting and have regard to the interests of crofters. But I think the National Development Plan can fulfil the purpose of providing uh, further clarity about who can provide support to um, to crofters in respect of. Um, particular ways in which they may wish to develop their craft. I'm also very cognizant of the fact that our R100 programme convener will provide uh, improved connectivity with access to high-speed broadband at 30 megabits per second, and our mobile infill programme uh, seeks to address non-spots, especially in the rural and island communities. I'm now going to go back to to John Finney with a small question, and then we're going to move on to the next question. Th th thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, people in the Crofting counties are, are, are very practical people, and a, a real issue, as ever, is housing. Um, how will that feature in the development plan? Because it, or indeed, will it feature in? Because it's absolutely core, and uh, you know, you mentioned this some previously, which has been welcomed. But if we are really going to um, not only um, build but sustain communities, we're going to need more housing. Um, yes, it, 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 I think I think Mr. Finney is absolutely correct, and I, I absolutely endorse what he says. And there's a number of ways that. Uh, doing that. I mean, my colleague, uh, Kevin Stewart, who's dealing with housing, has taken a very close interest in special provisions and policies for the Highlands. Um, I myself had a, a very fruitful meeting in Inverness a few weeks back with the Highlands Small Communities Housing Trust, who do excellent work. I referred to Woodland Crofts, and I've asked them to continue to play a part and a role in that. Um, I do feel very proud of the fact that the the, uh, the grant scheme, the Croft House grant scheme, has <coughs> assisted 800 families uh, over the past 11 years. And uh, in my period, my brief period in, at the helm, as it were, um, there's been 70, um, 70 grant offers at a cost of 2.4 million. And that's, you know, 70 families directly having the opportunity to build or improve a house in their own part of Scotland and secure their future 
and help to secure the sustainability of communities and the school roles uh, which depend upon having young people coming in. So, so that's a very practical scheme and quite a cost-effective scheme in providing um, a bit of extra support for people to, to build or improve a house. And obviously, as Finney knows, the costs are very often higher of building a house or improving a house in, in the, the islands or remote communities uh, for, for various reasons that the member will understand. Thank you. Okay. Come back to Kate and then so, move on. If I may. last question on phase two. In a previous letter to the committee, uh, the Cabinet Secretary wrote that the second phase would work towards clarity for those issues which are complex in nature and sometimes provoke contradictory <coughs> views. And without asking for a, a list necessarily of what's in phase two, what ways will phase two meet that, those um, objectives? Well, I, I think phase two is intended to consider issues which, is, as uh, Kate Forbes says, convener, are much more complex or have the potential to uh, uh, divide opinion. Uh, it's likely to focus on all crofting issues, not simply the ones that Mr O'Neill has alluded to uh, in his description of some of the phase one um, items or potential phase one items. Um, I think it's fair to say that phase two is likely to focus on really thorny issues such as assignation and succession, common grazings and owner-occupier crofts. Um, and each of these, I think, are recognised as, as being highly complex areas. I mean, myself, I've come to the conclusion that the difficulty that is faced here between those who wish fundamental reform and those who do not wish fundamental reform is a desire to retain the security that the 1886 Act conferred but a matching desire to develop and further sustain communities into the future by enabling and facilitating things to be done. So if there's a way to combine the security of the past with the sustainability of the future, then I think perhaps that would, that would signpost the, the work that we need to do in phase two. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Colin. Uh, and there's a couple more questions, Cabinet Secretary, so I would mindful of the time, like to try and get through them, say, Colin. Sure. Thanks, Convener, and good morning to the panel. In the consultation analysis report, a number of non-legislative measures were identified, such as promoting <coughs> crofters' rights, um, housing-related support, which John Finney's obviously touched on, and, and also support for new entrants into crofting, the latter of which you, um, you touched on, Cabinet Secretary, in your opening comments. So can I ask you to elaborate on what non-legislative changes you're considering and when and how these will be implemented? Um, well, I've, I've uh, very fair question. I've, I've mentioned the development plan, that's one. Um, I've mentioned a new entrance scheme and uh, you know the, the government remains committed to introducing a new entrance scheme for crofting and we welcome the work that incidentally has already been done on this topic by the stakeholder forum because it's of critical importance to encourage people into crofting to ensure the long-term sustainability of crofting and our crofting um, communities and for members' interest, the stakeholders have been drafting a priority paper on new entrants, which I understand is close to being finalised. So a lot of work has, has been done in the background, um, as I think Mr O'Neill demonstrated from his, his earlier resume of the contents or proposed contents of phase one. And a lot of work has been done by the stakeholders, a lot of work has been done by the Crofting Commission, particularly to address controversies ar 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 arising from individual cases about grazing committees and their operation. And uh, a template for guidance is being developed and is close to, I, think, I believe is close to completion from the Crofting Commission there and then. So uh, to answer Mr Swift's question, a whole raft of non-legislative work is being done by the government and by our partners and stakeholders. Can I just touch on the new entrance scheme? Do we have a sort of time scale as to when that's likely to be rolled out? Uh, well, of course, uh, you know, 800 new entrants uh, or potential new entrants have arisen through the crofting grant scheme. So that's mm. a very practical way to enable people to stay on the land or, or move to the land in crofting terms. Um, we are going to work closely with the stakeholders uh, uh, a engagement process because their work, as I said, is close to being finalised uh, and the scheme will be further developed over the next uh, uh, six months or so. Um, obviously, the implementation will be budget dependent and I don't want to uh, veer into Brexit issues here, but, you know, plainly, Pillar 2 is not the subject of, uh, of clear assurances from the UK government. But uh, I don't want to be negative today, conveners, you know, so I won't dwell on that. 
and just say that we're very keen to build on the, the good work we've done in new entrants uh, and uh, work uh, with the stakeholders to bring forward a, a practical and sensible scheme that will help to bring yet more people back into or remain in the Crofting counties. Can I just briefly can we touch, touch on just the responsibility of, of, of the different initiatives? In 2009, the government transferred responsibility for Crofting development from the Crofting Commission to, to Highlands and Highlands Enterprise. And some of the feedback that I've received is that mm -hmm. since then, High haven't really done a great deal to, to provide support and, and pathways to young people and, and new entrants. <coughs> Has consideration been given to, to transferring back that responsibility to the, to the Crofting Commission? Because they seem to have that sort of direct responsibility. Sorry. You know, authority on or, 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 or on Commission uh, Crofton, whereas High tend to look more at the sort of wider Crofton community support rather than that sort of direct scheme like like new entrance schemes. I know from my own personal knowledge of uh, board members and employees of HIE that they take a very close interest in these matters. But to be fair to them, um, it's really Business Gateway and not HIE that has the role of providing direct assistance to smaller business. I mean that's. Just a fact, but it's in the, the, the DNA of HIE to consider and promote uh, work and um, a economic endeavour in uh, the Highlands and Islands area. Um, and I would also point out that there is an express reference to inclusion in the legislation of the promotional role which the Commission have. Uh, and uh, I think that that is, is work that can be, that, that is a part of their role which we can further build upon and uh, it's one which I look forward to discussing with the Commission when I meet with them again. Uh, Colin, I'm going to move on to the next question, if I may, uh, with penultimate question to John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, there's already been mention of the stakeholders' views of the proposals, and I think you quoted they were quite positive. I just was looking at some of the wording um, of the uh, response, firstly, from the Scottish Crofting Federation, um, and they talk about the bill in this parliamentary session which corrects the major anomalies. Um, so there's agreement that that should happen. I just wonder, is there also agreement as to what the major anomalies are? I mean, we've had a list uh, or suggestions. Are they all broadly agreed, do you think, or will there be disagreement on that? The stakeholders are working through that list. We had a meeting last week. There is another one planned this month. Um, and the, the, the anomalies we can look to fix in phase one would be subject to those discussions. Um, clearly, um, where stakeholders think that the anomalies are really sufficiently complicated and contentious potentially, uh, that that's something that they would wish to see in, in phase two, then that's, that's what we would would be doing so it's it's being worked through in terms of the list of things that I was reading from earlier and we also have a similar sort of list for the the other issues that uh, are, are not looking like ones that would be for phase one. Thank you uh, and then they go on in their uh, comments to say that that will pave the way to a consolidation bill in the next session. Now some people would think a consolidation bill meant just pulling together existing legislation and not making changes. Do you think they're just using the wrong word? Are they misunderstanding? Because I'm not getting the impression from you that it in, is a consolidation bill. In, in the next. terms of the response that the Scottish Crofting Federation provided, they were, in that response, supportive. Their preferred option was option two, which was change now and consolidate legislation afterwards, and you are correct, the consolidation would not make any material changes to legislation, it would just try and bring it all, all together. Um, obviously, with the discussions we've had with the stakeholder meeting, the, the, the Scottish Crofting Federation are part of that, that group, um, and they, are, they understand the process that we are, uh, or have outlined, and, and they are supportive of that route even though it may not lead to that consolidation, it may lead to, to something else. But that, that's something we have to then discuss as part of that phase two work to see where does it ed legislation really has to end up and where's the most sensible end point for it. Okay. Um, th then, I mean, I'm just wondering, how far can you go in this session? I, I mean, I accept that legislation, and Jamie Green made that point, you know, in a sense, another parliament is another session and it's completely new. 
But the suggestion is that some preparation will be done before that. And hopefully, if there was cross-party agreement, then whoever was the government next time would start, they'd be, they'd be kind of up and running because they'd already have quite a lot of work done. How much work could be done before a 2021? Well, a fair amount of work can, can be done. And I mean, I guess the, the purpose is to leave a legacy to an incoming administration. And of course, that legacy could well inform the manifestos of various parties at the next, uh, at the next election. Um, how much work can be done? Well, let's, let's see. But uh, there's a fair wind behind the approach that we've taken. I've identified some of, in response to Kate Forbes questioning, some of the areas which are far more complex. And I've identified the principle which I think underlies the approach that would encourage people to, to support on a majority basis more, uh, more fundamental reform. So um, I'm keen that we do a solid amount of work to answer John Mason's question in the hope that it, it would be of benefit to an incoming um, uh, administration. Uh, and uh, you know, I believe that it, it will. Uh, Michael, do you want just, to add to that? Just, just one additional point there, it will be short. In terms of this, the stakeholder group, the bill group, they are very keen not to lose sight of that phase two and want to start looking at that and it's something we will be discussing at a meeting probably in June because we're trying to get to the, the early part of sorting out that phase one list but certainly it's something that they, they don't want us to lose sight of. We, we're not going to lose sight of it. We're going to continue that work alongside the, the phase one. Uh, as I indicated, that was a penultimate group of questions. I, I, I would like to try and tie that whole uh, section together, if I may. Cabinet Secretary, you will have read our uh, recommendations in our report, and I will refer you and then explain you the sections 101 to 103 with the recommendations, which was to do with crofting policy. And the principle was that before we had any legislative reform, there should be a statement of overarching crofting policy from the government. Now, if that was put forward as recommended by this committee and discussed in this parliament, would it not mean that any work that is taken forward before the end of this parliament could be more likely to take into account the views of the parliament as well as the views of the government? Um, I think, uh, with your agreement, I think Mr Jackson is keen to have a shot. Gordon, welcome. First, <laughs> first and last <laughs> chance. <laughs> The, uh, the consultation exercise linked to the bill um, picked up on the overarching policy statement that was put forward by the Scottish Government um, and asked respondents whether they agreed or disagreed and if so, why they disagreed or agreed. 49% um, agreed with the statement, 51% disagreed with the statement. Of those who disagreed, they disagreed for different reasons. Some thought it was too complex, some thought it was too simple. And there was a whole array of different, uh, different reasons. Um, but the fact of the matter is that um, we, are, we are perfectly willing and to engage with the uh, crofting stakeholders and work up and refine the statement further. Um, currently, the statement encapsulates all the, 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 the various important uh, aspects of, of, of crofting, uh, about uh, maintaining uh, populations in remote rural uh, locations, contributing to the sustainability of, of communities, etc., etc. But it appears as, as if the form of words needs to be looked at and we need to try and take stakeholders with us. Thank you, Gordon. So there wasn't a clear majority for the government uh, statement, so it'd be useful, I think, Cabinet Secretary, for the Parliament to have a chance once you've reviewed the, the statement and come up with, with, with a statement on crofting policy to discuss that, to, to work out the way forward. I think that would be a welcome uh, addition, Cabinet Secretary. You may want to think about that or I'm happy to take a yes or no answer at this stage. Mm, I'll take it to Avi Zandam. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and uh, Michael and Gordon uh, for attending, and not forgetting Ian, although he didn't get to say anything. So thank you very much for attending. Um, and I now briefly suspend uh, the meeting to allow changeover of witnesses.
I'd like to reconvene this meeting of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee and move on to agenda item three, which is part of our salmon farming, farming in Scotland inquiry. Before we do, can I just remind everyone, please, to make sure that your mobile phones are in, on silent. And I'd like to invite members to declare any relevant interests. And I'm going to start off that by saying that I have an interest in a wild salmon fishery. Uh, does anyone else wish to make a declaration? No. So this is our fifth evidence session on the Committee's Salmon Farming in Scotland inquiry. Uh, the committee will take evidence today from aqu the aquaculture industry's representatives. Now, hopefully I've got everyone in the right order. Scott Lansborough, the former chief executive of the Scottish uh, Salmon Producers Organisation. Ben Hadfield, the Mar managing director of Marine Harvest Scotland. Uh, Craig Anderson, the chief executive of Scottish Salmon Company. Uh, Grant Cumming, the Managing Director of Greg Seafoods Shetland, uh, and Stuart Graham, the Group Managing Director of Gale Force. Before we move on to questions, I know um, I made the mistake of saying that, uh, and I'm not going to repeat that mistake, of saying that to some people have, that have been here before, they would know exactly how, how this works. But the way it works is that if you want to come in on a question, if you try and catch my eye, there are five of you. You might not all get to answer all the questions. Don't, once you've caught my eye and I brought you in, you don't need to touch any of the buttons on the microphones. Those will all be done for you. If you start seeing me waving my pen like this, that means that your time is coming up. And if I wave it more furiously, um, it means your time is really up. And I'm not going to tell you it, what happens if you ignore that. But uh, could I just please ask you, the, the, the aim is to get a balance of questions and answers. So I'd be very grateful um, if, if you could help me achieve that because there are a lot of questions as we go through uh, the uh, session today. And the first question on that note is from uh, Stuart Stevenson. Stuart, would you like to lead off, please? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, um, my colleague uh, Richard Lyle and myself are members of the a, a environment committee that has reported a, on many of the environmental issues around salmon farming. Um, but I think this committee is wanting to, as well as looking at that again, uh, look at uh, wider economic issues. And it's on that subject uh, that I want to uh, ask a few questions. Um, and in particular, based on last week's evidence from, for example, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, um, what to what benefits are there to communities and the people in communities uh, in uh, adjacent salmon farming? Who'd like to start off on that? No, that doesn't work. You don't all look away uh, where, where, when, <laughs> when the question's asked. You've got to help me. So, Ben, you can come in to start with then. Yeah, well, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak today at the committee. I think uh, the economic benefits for local communities are significant. Um, the wage bill from my company in Marine Harvest is £47 million per year. Uh, we employ 1,250 people. Uh, approximately 700 of those are based on, on the West Coast and uh, Lewis, Harris, Barra, etc. And interestingly, what you've seen over time is that the, the role within the farms has become much more complex. It used to be a job with a farm manager and farm hands. Now it's become uh, more technical, employing a lot of scientists, a lot of veterinarians, uh, people with IT skills, etc. And so the wage structure reflects that. And because I've lived, uh, I'm English, but uh, I've lived in Scotland for, for 18 years, because I've lived on the West Coast, what you see is it's important that people can have a career and have good steady wage progression. And so that is, is very uh, yeah, well received in, in the areas that we farm in. Okay, uh, Craig, and then I'll come back to you, Stuart. Yeah, the, the Scottish Salmon Company also takes seriously our social and economic impact we're having in local communities, uh, support local communities, uh, not just through salary, which is very important. Our annual salary uh, is around £16 million, uh, with the 1.5 million national insurance contributions, 700,000 pensions uh, contributions. Uh, that's very important, but training, uh, education in local areas, uh, getting involved in... We have third-generation families working with our company. It is very encouraging. 25% uh, of the people have been with us more than 10 years. It's great. So to be able to put something back that we take out of, it is very important for us too. 
Stuart. Uh, thank you. And I, I want to address something to uh, Scott Lands rep, but maybe just technically, although you're a former executive, you're nonetheless still representing the SSPO today. I am indeed, yes. Yeah, thank yes. you for that. Yes. Um, the SSPO's Community Engagement Charter uh, is designed to benefit communities. How is that, uh, how's that going to work? How is that working? Well, it's a charter all of our member companies have signed up to, which is a commitment to give uh, the, the local communities some direct benefit from, uh, the, the, if you like, the, the yield from the, the local farm. <coughs> and um, I can tell you in, in round numbers, last year we uh, con contributed around £1 million to local communities in various uh, schemes. Um, each company has its own scheme, but nevertheless, they're all committed to abiding by the rules of the Charter. And that was what the Charter was all about, to, 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 good, to do good practice in, in community benefit. And we've been, we looked at a number of schemes, uh, national schemes that are already in place. And so we're similar to some of the other industries that are, uh, operate in highlands and islands, remote rural communities. And it's direct uh, support, not all of it financial, some of it is actually just giving of time, it's actually uh, education support, getting into the schools, getting into um, even nurseries as well, we get involved in as well. We also uh, have bought um, small mini buses to transport people to uh, local community, youth community uh, uh, facilities. And, and it's ongoing, but it's a commitment that the industry has to, at this juncture of the road, to put in at least a million pounds to local communities. Um, I think this will be my last uh, question. Who decides what the benefit is? Is that the uh, salmon producers deciding? What role is there for the communities themselves helping decide how that benefit is applied? Decided at a more local level. So people are uh, encouraged, uh, invited to bid for, for uh, support, basically, and, and the companies themselves are really in charge of, of that. But the, I know one or two have independent people involved in that and the scrutiny of that. So it's, it's, it's a quite an open process. It's not just a question of who you know or, or, or that sort of thing. And that was uh, the purpose behind the Charter, is to make it an open process. Convener. Gail. Thank you. Good morning, panel. Um, We've been speaking quite a lot in these evidence sessions about expansion of the industry, um, but certainly in my constituency um, in West or Ross, there is a massive problem with housing. How can we expand the industry if there are no houses available for people that you want to recruit to fish farms? And how are you working with local authorities to try and solve this? Ben, I'll bring you in. I'm quite keen to bring some of the other members of the panel in, so, so don't be shy if you, if you want to, to come in. Ben. Just, um, very quickly, we, we need to build more houses and some of the, the great projects that we've worked on in the past uh, few years and, and months uh, where we've put a, uh, a new farm into the islands like Mock or Rum and we've had a proposal to build half a dozen houses, shore base, and then gradually and managing the social implications well, hopefully move people out and kind of repopulate a bit. Grant, do you want to add something to that? Yes, uh, I think it's a, it's a very valid concern. It's been a particular problem for, for Greek seafood. In um, Shetland recently, we had uh, a, a new gas terminal being built, and that put a huge pressure on the housing stock. And so we had to go and secure rented accommodation for, for employees. And uh, down in Skye, it's a long-term problem for us where we're farming as well. So we've had to go and purchase properties. But I think a, a better long-term solution is to look to buy more properties, because by purchasing, we're obviously just putting more pressure on an existing small marketplace. OK. Um, yeah, Peter. And if, if you're building new houses, Ben, or, or buying new houses, I mean, are they then tied houses to, you, to your business? I assume that you will require whoever stays in that house to, to be a, uh, an employee of yours, and if they leave your employment, do they then have to move out the house? Is that the system that you, you would put in place? Um, uh, yeah, Gra hold on, Grant, and then I'll come to you, Ben. Uh, yes, I mean, the houses are there to provide accommodation for our employees. Um, we have tried as much as possible to be... Um, I think, nice about it, though. Uh, if we have people who are choosing to leave our employee, we haven't asked them to be out the house the next day. So we've given them a period of grace. But we would expect them to move on to make space for, for our employees in future, yes. Yep. Ben, you want to come in? 
Just varying methods of doing it. Uh, it's some on the islands where there's a landowner or it's in a trust and it's been leased on um, the 25 years. We've put the uh, money in to build the houses and then it's for our staff while they work there or for the families. Uh, the feed plant that we're doing on Sky, that's created 55 new jobs and some of those are quite specialist in terms of engineering and IT and, and manufacturing. <coughs> so we've got land available there and we will have plans to move for planning permission, build houses and probably sell the house to uh, an employee after a period of time working with the company and, and moving and becoming resident on Sky. And then of course there's partnerships with affordable home schemes. Uh, where you're doing it as part of a wider build and putting in some of the economics and that that's very interesting to us. Okay, I'm going to move on to the uh, next question. Jamie. Uh, thank you, convener, <clears throat> and uh, good morning, panel. Um, so uh, I'd like to maybe just take a step back and look at the bigger picture of the international market that uh, Scotland is operating in. It's clearly a very competitive market. Um, I think it would be a rhetorical question to ask how important provenance and high production standards are to the industry. I presume the answer from each of you would be yes, they are important. So uh, perhaps I could push further in terms of the differences between the export market and the domestic market in terms of the product that you make and how you, 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 you produce it, and also what your views are on how Scottish salmon can stand out distinctively against some of our main competitors, such as Norway, Chile or, or Canada, etc. Grant? Yeah, it's a very interesting point, and, and I think we're already standing out against our main competitors on the global scale. Uh, there is a premium out there for Scottish salmon, that's both um, in our domestic market and externally as well. And I think the reason that we have that is because provenance, we're obviously um, growing our salmon in, in beautiful, wild Scotland, um, but also, in addition to that, I think that the regulatory standards within Scotland are very highly regarded internationally. We're seen as having a very high standard and delivering a product that reflects that. Stuart, you haven't come in yet. I mean, would you like to, would you like to come in at this stage or...? No, I, I think it's maybe more appropriate for some of the other questions. We've got producers here, and I think most of these questions are pretty okay. much more relevant to producers. Um, but I'll Craig, come. and then, uh, then I'll come to Ben. Scotland's very, very important, uh, as is provenance. Uh, we have trademarked uh, the phrase provenance guaranteed, and, uh, and also tartan salmon, specifically for the export market. The story is always, uh, is it true that your fish come from Scotland? And the answer is yes, we only produce and sell fish that comes from Scotland. And uh, with the quality that, that, that Grant said, the accreditations we go through, the thoroughness of it, and the, the pure quality of the salmon, and we get a premium price for it. So it's very important going forward. Uh, ben, do you want to come in? Yeah, just to give you some numbers. The, um, you know, worldwide, there's around 2.1, 2.2 million tonnes produced. Um, Norway takes the lion's share of that at around 1.1. Our volume is around 1.75. Scotland sits number third. Uh, if you look at just purely in cost when you buy salmon, you see a premium for Irish salmon, uh, organic salmon, then Scottish Labelle Rouge production. Uh, some, most of the companies produce specifically for some of the supermarkets here domestically to very high kind of welfare and environmental standards. That's the next price bracket. And then you, you don't really see a commodity product with salmon anymore. You know, it is a, it is a high uh, value protein. Uh, but uh, generally, Scottish salmon trades around 50 pence, 60 pence per kilo over a Norwegian salmon. And, and that's really because, as, as the gentleman said here, it's regarded as producing a sustainable uh, way, good regulation, uh, high quality, uh, quite desirable. Scott, you're, you're not going to rest and, unless I bring you in. So I'll bring you in, but I do make the point I can't bring you in on all of everyone on all of the questions. So, Scott, I'll bring you in and then come to Stuart Stevenson. I think it should be said, uh, um, every three years the, the uh, survey, uh, 14, um, yeah, 14 of the major seafood buyers in the world's markets at the Brussels Seafood Show, which took place last week in Brussels. I'm not sure if, because I'm now an out of it, I'm not sure if they uh, c conducted a survey last week, but certainly in 2016 they conducted the second uh, survey uh, at which Scotland received seven votes out of 14 as being the best farm salmon in the world. Its uh, nearest competitor uh, received two votes, that was Norway and Canada, and then the other producing countries received one. Now these people uh, 
know what they're doing. They know what they're buying. They know they're buying quality. They know they're buying a seriously premium fish. And, and I think that's an accolade we're very proud of. In, incidentally, it's the third time running that we've won the best farm salmon uh, accolade. Okay. And, and I, I think it's fair to say that we, we did ask retailers in this country to come to the committee. And, and unfortunately, whilst they've submitted written, written evidence, they were indisposed when we when we requested them to come which i think was a sadness uh, stuart did you want to uh, just a, a wee brief point i think probably to grant based on what uh, he 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 said and i can be corrected in this is there not an international trade in smalts and if there is how does that affect the provenance uh, that we rely on to sell products and i believe it's two ways as well it is possible to import and export smolts from areas of uh, equivalent disease status. Um, I think that uh, currently the vast majority of the smolts are, are Scottish, if not all. Um, it's more common for possibly eggs to come from abroad. Um, that can be still a, a Scottish quality salmon. Uh, Jamie, back to you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, can I uh, uh, pick you up on that point? It, I was quite surprised to learn that uh, in the, certainly the uh, perhaps question from Marine Harvest that the, all of the eggs come from Norway. Uh, so how does that add to the provenance of it being a Scottish product? Um, of course, it's quite typical in, in farming generally to, to move uh, stock types around the world. You know, beef, beef farming, uh, chicken farming, uh, pig farming, that's exactly the case there. What you have with uh, salmon production is a requirement to take the eggs from broodstock in multi-sea winter fish, so from big rivers. And the majority of the worldwide industry for salmon uh, uses Norwegian stocks. They've been bred uh, over time. Some, there are some elements of uh, Scottish stocks within that. Uh, but they're used in Canada, Norway, and, and, and Scotland. I'm happy to leave that there. Um, I, if I'd quite like to bring Craig in, because I think he may have a different story to tell on that. Craig, do you want to come in on that? Yes, thank you. Uh, the Scottish Salmon Company also import in Norwegian eggs, but we started a, a programme that has been so far invested £3 million into native Hebridean. So we have a native Hebridean broodstock programme based in Langas, such that this is, is, is based on wild stock from the River Uist. It's Scottish egg, uh, Scottish fish, and by 2020 we aim to 15% of our production native Hebridean and growing. Stuart, you wanted to come in. Yeah, if, if you may allow me, uh, um, Chairman, just, just a general point. So uh, I, I'm from a company in the supply chain, so we're one of the largest suppliers to the industries, just so everybody is clear that, that we're not a producer, so that's why I'm not participating in some of these questions. If I might be allowed a small comment on two, two of the subjects mm -hmm. so far. On the community question that was asked, um, I think think beyond direct community uh, donations uh, and assistance and direct jobs uh, employed by producing companies, remember there are suppliers and a very large supply chain, small and large, throughout the country and the rural areas supported in these communities. About five times the jobs in the supply chain for everyone in the production companies. Um, so that's just one point. And the other point was about regulation. Just like to say that I see uh, you know, a need to rationalise regulation, however, robust regulation I see has been a key part of uh, Scottish provenance, and I, that may be part of the reason why we, we see some premium. I, I suspect um, that regulation is going to form part of the questioning later on in the session, so you, you, you may find you can get in on that. Uh, Jamie. Thank you, Vinay. I continue along this theme of uh, provenance uh, and quality. And uh, presumably part of that is around certification and in industry, international industry standards. Um, I'll perhaps ask first a specific question of Marine Harvest. Why is it uh, that your Norwegian farms are signed up to the Aquaculture Stewardship Council? I'm not aware of how many or percentage-wise, but many are, yet only one in Scotland is. Could you just explain that? Ben. The, the the company supports the ASC standards. It's a kind of, uh, it's very robust, uh, and it deals with things out with regulation. Now, the ASC standards, when they were written, mainly or predominantly took a lot of the environmental regulation from Scotland, and that's because it was the most robust and, and, and the best in the world in terms of protecting the environment. But the ASC standards go beyond that and talk about social license, more in-depth into wild fish and, and mitigating impacts there. 
Marine Harvest uh, at a board level decided that it would uh, try to make all the farms ASC accredited by 2020. And uh, in Norway, we have around 40% of the sites accredited. Um, in, in Scotland, we, we have one site, we did have uh, two. And we have now just got over the hurdle that exists within the standard for smalt production in, in freshwater lakes or locks in Scotland. And it was really that uh, the ASC standards prevented the farming of smolts in freshwater lakes. And that's why we didn't do that. Uh, we, we didn't take up the ASC. Now that that has been amended, we will move all the sites in Scotland to ASC accreditation. And if I may convene, I just have to explain that quite technically. The, the trophic status, the nutrient levels in the lakes in Norway and, and Chile and Canada are fundamentally different to what we have here in Scotland. Uh, we have lakes that are borderline oligotrophic, mesotrophic, meaning that they can accept and deal with sustainably a higher level of nutrients from farming. And that science wasn't recognized within the ASC standards. So once we had it changed uh, from evidence, then we were able to move more of the sites to ASC. 40% of your Norwegian sites are ASC accredited. Uh, do you have a target or a time scale in mind for your Scottish sites yeah, to, we, to reach the, the 100 that you aim for? Now, now that that has been amended and we've had a, a more scientific, uh, thorough assessment within the ASC standard, we will move quickly to put all the sites in Scotland to ASC. All sites? Yes. Quickly. As quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, yeah. so, Before you go on, can I just clarify? I mean, that was to do with uh, smolts in, in, in freshwater, or production of smolts in freshwater. It, it, do you have any escapes in fresh water of, of, of juvenile fish before they're collected and, and taken out to the um, uh, to the farms or offshore? Yeah, and we've been farming in in, the, in freshwater locks here in Scotland for more than thirty years, and there has been a history of, of escape events recorded. There has, sorry, it, it has happened. Yeah, yeah. The, the the general trend for escapes both in in the sea and in fresh water is has declined rapidly. Uh, our last escape uh, in fresh water was over a decade ago. Um, and so, yeah, very low, but there is still a risk of it. And the way that that's been addressed in the ASC standard is to implement a kind of gold level practice of containment. Things like Kevlar nets, uh, a minimum size of fish entered, count uh, in, count out, etc. Uh, sorry, just before we move on, Scott, so I can understand it across all of the industry, is that the same? Is, is, is the escapes into fresh water of juvenile <coughs> fish declining, yeah, or have there been none for 10 years? I can't say there have been none for 10 years, no. Uh, there, there have been in the last 10 years across the industry, but it, as Ben says, it has been declining, and we're Im improving matters, e by investment. Maybe Stuart could come in on, on some of the technology being applied now with regard to moorings and barriers. But um, the other thing is we've got a, a new technical standard, a, a national technical standard that has uh, arisen from the Ministerial Working Group on Aquaculture and is now part of um, our, our code. Uh, and all the companies are abiding by that. A lot of it is actually um, uh, focusing on uh, uh, actually human behavior. We've got to train our people to ensure that they maintain the nets in, in, the, in the best possible condition to ensure that we contain the fish. And that has, there has been human error involved in the past, and we believe that we're moving quite significantly in that direction. Um, I'm going to have to apologize, Jamie, for jumping in, but, but Peter wants to come in, and then I'll come back to you. So, Peter. Well, I, I, maybe Jamie was going to ask, but I, I would just ask a uh, Craig and Grant, are they going to go down the same route? Are they, are they hoping to be ASC accredited as well in the near future? Or, or, or the the, the Scottish Salmon Company have already got hold on, hold on. four. Sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. I was going to let Grant in first because he, he oh, indicated. Oh, yes. So I'll let Grant in and then, Craig, I'll definitely come to you. Okay. Grant. I, I suspect we might have fairly similar answers. Um, it's uh, one standard out of, of hundreds of standards that are out there. Um, We've got a number of standards that we do comply to, including uh, RSPCA, Farm Assured, Global Gap, of course, the Code of Good Practice and PGI. Those are the four that we've got currently. However, it's always a moving uh, playing field. So it'll really be customer-led for us which, set of, uh, which standards we go for in future. And I certainly wouldn't rule out ASC. Okay. <coughs> Craig, do you want to add to that? Yeah, yes, please. Uh, 
the Scottish Salmon Company is similar. We have uh, four world uh, class and world uh, accreditations. Uh, the, the latest one we got was the best aquaculture practice, uh, which we believe is the most uh, comprehensive third party uh, aquaculture certification that there is, because it's, it's the full process from, from egg to, to in the truck and includes feed companies and, uh, and freshwater marine processing plants. So we're happy with what we have. But with the recent changes in, in the ESC coming forward, I will certainly look at it again and, and review. Mm. Jamie. Uh, thank you. That, that, uh, thanks to Mr Chairman. That segues nicely into uh, my next question around wider certification uh, internationally. Uh, but before I do so, can I make a point of clarification with uh, Mr Hadfield from uh, Marine Harvest? Is it that the changes uh, the, the, the barriers to SE accreditation were related to um, smoke farming and freshwater loss. How does that inhibit farms where the smokes are farmed in tanks and then sent directly to seawater, i.e. there's no freshwater lock element? Why were they unable to SE certify? That was the reason why we had only two farms ASC standard, because the way that we run our business is a lot of fish start off in the hatcheries, <coughs> and increasingly recirculation hatcheries, where water is, is purified and recirculated through. Then the move to the locks at around 30 grams, and then grown up into a smalt at around 120 grams, and then to sea. But that meant for us that roughly about 90% of our fish had been through the farming systems in, in the lock. And so that, that we had to go back to the ASC and get them to change that standard. And just to be very straight about it, it really was that the, the ASC had not recognised the scientific circumstances of, of freshwater environments in Scotland. It, it was not that uh, we pushed them to change or anything else, but you know, sticking to science and being accountable by science is very important in this business. Uh, th thanks for that clarification. So on, uh, uh, um, someone mentioned the fact there are hundreds of certification schemes uh, out there that one could accredit with or, or align oneself with. Um, is that a problem? Uh, the fact that there's no international industry standard on production, on uh, provenance, uh, that one producer can sign to one uh, system uh, or, or another in another part of the world to another, does that make it difficult therefore to uh, align the industry and, and create a, a true balance of certification and provenance and uh, of the many schemes, which are the, the most widely recognised, which, which are, are, are the Scottish producers signed up to that, that help give the Scottish product that provenance that it so desperately needs? I'm going to bring Scott in first and then Craig. <coughs> to answer your question with regard to the, the one most widely used is Global Gap. 80% of our production is Global Gap accredited. Global Gap is the accreditation scheme, and that's recognised in international markets. But I think... It, um, Ben Hadfield uh, alluded to it earlier that the backstop of all production standards is the Scottish Code of Good Practice. That's, that was really what, what pr produced all those standards to a, a common level, if you like, and then they've all enhanced that uh, with their own uh, additions and attributes. Uh, but that really is the, is the basis of, of um, production standards and is recognised worldwide as that and, and all other countries are really have, have followed that and I think it's something we should be proud of in Scotland. This industry did it off its own back in 2006 and it's been a, a tremendous success but again in the marketplace there's a bit of differentiation between retail markets, the different retailers have different standards for the, for the product on their shelves. And, and uh, again, we've, we have another accreditation. We were the first um, non-French food to receive La Belle Rouge uh, accreditation. We produced that to a different standard to our uh, superior fish. So th there, there's a lot in the mix there to consider, but all of it is, is designed to ensure uh, high food quality and, and, and high food safety as well. Craig. Code of good practice, I absolutely agree. It's, it's a pinnacle, it's very tough, robust, uh, it's exacting. Uh, we, we all adhere to it. It's very, very important that we do that. With, with the other uh, accreditations that are out there, uh, it's expensive. Uh, Scottish Salmon Company pay over £160,000 a year on third-party audits, uh, which we welcome. But when we get Global Gap, Friends of the Sea, RSPCA, um, BAP, and I can go on and on and on, when, when you go to a major retailer, 
they are very professional companies. They have their own technical teams and sometimes their own accreditation that they want you to adhere to as well with a separate audit. So we, we work closely with retailers and, and try to align with what, what they want at the same time. So we, we have four uh, accreditations and we're happy with that. As I will look at ASC, but we have to mind the, the technical uh, con um, considerations of, of, of retailers and their, their own accreditations that they want to attain. Jamie, do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, so, I mean, by that answer, can I take it, therefore, that the accreditation process is driven by the retail market rather than through third parties, such as environmental aspects or, or uh, other uh, ag aquacultural interests? Uh, clearly, it's a retail product at the end of the day. I appreciate that. And, and you're, you're driven by what your, your buyers are asking for in terms of their standards. But is that, is that at the forefront of the decision making when it comes to accreditation? Or uh, is, is it a, you know, how do you make those decisions, given that there is a, quite a substantial cost in doing so? Ben, I'm going to let you answer, and then I'm going to move on to the next question, which is Kate Forbes. So, so there are around about 20, actually, standards. It's not quite the, the number that, that was uh, discussed before. And they're kind of, they're all very similar, but you, the, in, the retailers are looking for a point of differentiation, and there's an element of competition about who can come up with the most robust standard. So the history of this is it really started in Scotland, and it came from the code of practice and the regulation here, which was seen to be the best, and then it's been taken wider, and now it goes into... Uh, yeah, environmental groups wanting their own stamp on how uh, salmon should be farmed. Okay, Kate. Great, thank you very much. Um, last week we had James Withers of Scotland Food and Drink in front of us and we were talking about the Scottish brand generally and the importance of the, the perception that Scottish um, farmed salmon is produced in pristine waters. And he mentioned that the, the industry at large wants to embrace world-class standards, and I certainly think we've heard that this morning. If that's the case, what improvements do you think are still necessary to uh, improve the industry overall and make it even better and bring it higher up in terms of world-class standards? Because presumably none of you are standing still. And I'm looking at environmental issues and broader issues as well. And I'm going to give Ben, Craig and Grant the opportunity to answer that. So uh, let's go the other way around. Grant, let's, why don't you start it off? OK, uh, yeah, I think uh, you're right. Our, our uh, premium out there in the marketplace depends upon us having very high regulatory standards. I think we've got them today. I think there's more that can be done, though, possibly to look at um, coordinating the regulations that are out there. At the moment, we require at least five licences to, to operate a fish farm, and those are um, run by different regulatory bodies. And they're, while all our regulators are very good and very thorough, there is the opportunity for things to sometimes fall between stools. Um, I mean, I think a, a crucial one is perhaps uh, sea lice and sea lice medicines. So sea lice numbers are being regulated by one body, sea lice medicines by another. And actually, there's possibly an opportunity to look at more holistic regulations that could help drive down both sea lice medicine usage and sea lice numbers under the one regulator. I think something like that could really help. OK. Craig, would you like to come in? Hmm. The animal welfare and, and the... Uh, the benthics and the, the, the care of the fish in the seabed is, is our responsibility and we, we have to keep on improving it. We, we just have to, it's, it's our duty to do that. And that's investment in technology, it's investment in training, it's investment in new veterinary procedures uh, and, and new ways and, and non-chemical ways of, of treating fish to keep fish healthy, to, to keep them cleaner. The use of cleaner fish, uh, the use of technology in nets, the use of technology in cameras to make sure that the feed has been utilised 100%. All of this and, and more we must do on a daily basis and keep on researching and investing in new technology to go forward. So it's very important and, and that's, as an industry, that's where we want to work together to, to continually improve. Ben. Well, as you know, it's, it's quite a young industry. You know, the first farms were here about 50 years ago, um, and it, it moves quite quickly. It's dynamic. Uh, we have had uh, very good regulation in Scotland to protect the environment, and uh, it's frustrating, actually, to, to listen to uh, comments that we don't have that, because the reality is we, we do. Uh, but as the industry 
uh, evolves from a quite a young base, then that reg legislation should change quickly and be dynamic. You, you asked what the opportunities were. I think we have to acknowledge that it's been a difficult period in salmon farming. You know, we, we had uh, 2010, 2011, some of the lowest mortality rates globally uh, at around 7%. And, and really, from what I see in operating and working in a worldwide uh, company, is that for the industry as a whole, or is that for marine harvest? No, I was about to clarify. So I, I work globally within marine harvest, and, and really, if you had seven percent mortality in the seawater phase, then you were in kind of, marine harvest. Yeah, in marine harvest, then then you were kind of top of the pile within the group, and, and that's where Scotland was in 2009, 10, and 11. Um, since then, we've had what I've termed in, in a letter uh, to, to the committee, akin to a perfect storm, where we've had. Uh, El Nino conditions raising the temperature of the Atlantic, so we've had warmer seas in coastal areas. Uh, we've had reduced efficacy of the sea lice medicines, meaning that we've had to use less medicine and bring in other methods of treatment. And so what you've seen in that time is mortality levels have increased. And part of what I've done uh, in the fish, farmed fish health working group is set out some measures that could enhance the regulation and go further and reduce the risk of mortality or the development of mortality within the industry. And I think one of the things that we do need to consider is that we could consolidate the, the industry and have fewer, larger farms, less connected in areas less sensitive and, and still maintain or even increase the amount of production that we have here. And that might take some of the stakeholder conflict down a bit in, in my view. Um, we are just, I mean, I want to clarify so there's no doubt we will be looking specifically as a committee with you on mortality, sea lice and disease. So I think if, if, if we can leave focusing on those till, till later and, and more on the generality. Kate, sorry. I'm, I'm content with that. It's just one okay. question. Thank you. Um, Richard, uh, sorry, did you want to come in, Mike? Mike, if you want to come in, I'm very happy. I, I'm, Richard's getting the first bite and you're getting the second bite. So, Richard. Thank you, convener. Um, so, it's set the scene. Scottish salmon production, success story in Scotland, farm salmon in uh, Scotland's uh, and UK's largest food export, 10,340 jobs, £270 million pound paid out in, in pay per annum. And on a, a visit this week to one of your farms, um, uh, ben, I was impressed with the level of wages you paid. I'm sure you all pay that level of wages. Um, but I believe the Scottish Government wants to double the amount of production. Production was 162,817 tonnes, according to Scottish Government official records. So, with that, industry has growth targets. There's a demand for the product. It's an excellent product. I believe it's uh, uh, a very tasty product. But output appears to be relatively flat. Why? Because uh, you were looking away. <laughs> Thank you for that, <laughs> Kinvina. <laughs> well, <laughs> firstly, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, I think it, it, it demonstrates um, how, basically, how difficult and challenging it has been for this industry. Uh, to grow in, in recent years to where it wants to be. It's uh, had a lot of challenges. Ben Hadfield mentioned recent challenges um, with regard to uh, fish health performance and the investment that's gone into that. And, and additionally, the consenting process is tough. We like it to be tough. There's nothing wrong with the consenting process being tough. We think that's important. It has to be rigorous because it, it has to ensure long-term sustainability for this industry. So we accept that and we work with it. But I think th th there needs to be a, a, a shift in, in uh, the culture here that uh, we, we get together with the regulators, we get together with government, we get together with the policy makers, and we actually all uh, really align with what we want to see. And I think that the baseline is that we want to ensure that we grow sustainably from a good health basis and from a, a, a good environmental basis as well. And that's wh where we are at the moment, is we've gone through a tough time in the last three or four years. Uh, we do think we're coming out of it, and we think that you'll see that in the in this, uh, data that's coming out, it's going to be published in the, in the coming months. Uh, and on, account, uh, on that basis, we want to work with yourselves, with uh, 
SIPA, uh, SNH, Marine Scotland in particular, to, to develop a programme of uh, um, uh, farming uh, fish in the, in the most appropriate and health enhancing way. And if we can do that, we believe aspirationally we can get to a target. We put out 300,000 because we were part of the uh, uh, Scotland Food and Drink programme. Uh, we've had a very successful, in the food and drink industry in Scotland, very successful uh, 10 years where we've doubled turnover from 7 billion to 14.5 billion. And the idea is then that let's, let's reach for the sky. Let's go to 2030 and go to 30 billion. So, that's, so we're the largest <coughs> part of the food part of that figure. And therefore, there's a bit of responsibility on us to deliver. And, and we're trying to do that. But we can only do it sustainably. And therefore, you know, at this juncture of the road, it's an aspirational um, uh, figure. But we want to work with all regulators to get there. Fort Grant, I think, comes in through you, convener. Ben, you mentioned it there a minute ago, and this is something I'm pressing. Um, we have to work together with all sections in the salmon industry, wild and uh, sorry, in order to double production. And, and you touched on it slightly there. To move a farm away from, say, a river that's been affected just now, the, the government gives you uh, possibly uh, more a chance to move to another part of Scotland and double your production take away a small, a small production area and move it up wherever and make it double, that, that we then, it's no use looking back, we've got to look to the future. So basically, I'm suggesting in order to do that, you know, what can we do to resolve the problem that we've got, that you've got in the, in the wild salmon um, and, and also people who are managing rivers have got question uh, slightly later. So I'm very happy if you want to give a short answer and then I'd like to bring Stuart in on the previous qu question with Grant. So Ben, if you'd like to answer that briefly. Um. Yeah, I think uh, first of all, it's a great observation and, and we can touch on it in more depth. It, it exists and ultimately the, the progressives on the wild fish side and the farm side working together will create more solutions going forward. The, the, the tensions and the heat and, and the arguing that, that, won't, that won't work. Um, but we can come on to it in okay. greater detail. Stuart. Yeah, I'd like to answer the question. I think Richard's question was, you know, wh why have we flatlined? And, uh, you know, I, together with, with another, uh, originated the, the strategy that you referred to that uh, sets out a, a doubling of the value of the industry. That's a nominal target uh, which we shouldn't be hung up on in terms of hundreds of thousands of tonnes, but we're looking to, to double the value of the industry out to 2030. <coughs> Remember my comment earlier on about the supply chain, how, how much value is in that in terms of the overall value to the economy. So that's very important and, and we can do lots of way of adding value to a smaller tonnage. So, so you know, our focus is on value. But to answer your question, the constraints that we saw in developing that strategy, the number one constraint was recognised then and is recognised now as the biological challenge. Mm -hmm. So the industry wholly recognises the biological challenge that it has. The number two challenge that we recognised actually in developing the strategy was the complexity uh, uh, of the, the regulatory uh, and, and consenting environment. Nobody's arguing for, for a less robust but a more streamlined uh, way of, of doing this uh, would, would help release the, the growth, um, as would we in the industry coming together to, to recognise uh, and overcome these biological challenges. That was the number one constraint. And because the whole strategy for growth is all about doing this sustainably, None of us in the industry expect to move on until we're on top of uh, the, you know, the, the, these, these challenges that, that exist. Um, so that's the answer. Thank you. Grant, would you like to... I'd like to thank Richard for, for his opening comments there, and I agree with what he said. Um, yes, this is, a, this is a great product. There's a colossal demand out there for it, and I think it benefits us all if we can grow this industry. But the number one most important thing is any growth must be sustainable. And as uh, Ben's mentioned already, we've been facing high water temperatures these past few years, partly as a result of um, El Nino, possibly partly to do with climate change as well. And that has created a new environment that we have to control uh, fish health in. That's been challenging for us. And we have had real trouble the last few years with raised mortality rates, raised numbers of sea lice uh, on one or two farms. 
And I think it's more important for us to get that in hand and to make the changes, make sure that we're starting from a good point before we begin to grow again. And in Greek Seafood, um, if I go back to 2010, we were operating on 33 sites. We're now operating on 17. So we've reduced the number of sites. We've increased the fallow periods. Um, we've created larger zones, management zones as well, which are followed synchronously. That means that all the fish are emptied out at the same time to give uh, a break from sea lice. So the sea lice can't reproduce on the salmon. Um, all these things have led to a reduced tonnage in the short term. So we've gone from a peak of 19,000 tonnes of harvest biomass down to 12,000. And we now believe that we've got these problems under control and we can see a much better that we're in a much better place than we were. And I think we can begin to grow now from there. Um, to give you a few facts, um, our mortality rates are down on the previous 12 months. They're down by 37%. Our adult female lice per average on our fish are down 87% from where they were a year ago. So that's good news stories, but we've had to do that before we can really look at our growth potential. And I would agree with you as well that, um, and what Ben was saying, that we maybe need to look at um, new plan applications, bigger sites, further out, more exposed waters. And that's what we're doing already as an industry. And I think the planning departments we've got around Scotland are doing an excellent job. But I think there might be a question sometimes with resources. I think they have a lot on their plates and it's difficult to get through everything in the timescales they need. That's a very comprehensive answer. I think we'll move straight on to the next question, uh, Mike, which is you. Convener. And I want to focus on your response to the Environment Committee's report and the problems that they've identified. And in their report, they actually say, um, you know, further development and expansion must be based on resolving the environmental problems. The status quo is not an option. And I've heard already that, that this morning comments from you from the panel saying we have a very good regulation, we have the very best regulation. Um, but evidence to us previously from other witnesses, Heather Jones, for instance, talked about the industry being self-regulating. Um, so my question is focused on this. Do you recognise the environmental problems, and Grant has just literally just finished talking about that, but I'd like to hear everybody else. Do you recognise the environmental problems? And if so, what do you think you need to do to, ch to change your operations? Um. And before, before we, you actually answer that, uh, I'm just going to say that there are, I'll just remind you, mortality, sea lice, uh, and things will be coming up specifically. So, Ben, if you'd like to answer that question, bearing that in mind, I'd be very grateful. Yeah, first of all, we, we recognise it, and we're, we're, we're very humble about it, which you must be when effectively you utilise the environment to assimilate the waste from, from our activities. And you try and do that in a predictable, uh, and monitored and sustainable way. Um, there are elements of the report which I believe go beyond evidence-based criticism and I've uh, wrote a letter uh, to, to set that out and uh, sent it to, to Donald Cameron and the convener. It's very recent that, that that's been sent but I've put that on record. Um, we will touch on them, uh, as you said, but we, we have to accept that mortality levels have, have been too high, and I can assure you that all the companies have, have put vast resources, literally, you know, figuratively thrown the kitchen sink at dealing with this issue, and we can come on to that. Uh, the, the sea lice issue and the hazard that uh, uncontrolled or badly controlled lice present to wild fish it is serious, and we take it very seriously. We need more research in that. Um, and we need to work collaboratively with the wild fish. But what we mustn't do is, is over-exaggerate it to, to the point of making salmon farming a single issue in, in certain areas. Uh, and I can assure you that that does happen. So, yes, we think the report is, is, is thorough and very good. It's obviously setting a clear uh, challenge of improvement to the industry. But also, as a scientist, I can assure you that there are areas where it goes beyond the evidence available. And, and I'm slightly concerned by that. Craig, do you want to come in? Because Grant sort of answered a lot of that in his, his previous answer. The, the Scottish Salmon Company environment, we, we're involved every single day. Uh, the, the, the issues and problems we have, we accept. Uh, we, we have to uh, humble a, a good word and feel sad about it and work up a plan. 
uh, with the industry, with our own scientists, with our own veterinaries, with the, 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 the government and the government agencies, a way forward to solve it. And, and that's what we've been working on. Uh, training, investment, new technology, new ships. Uh, three years ago, we had two ships at sea. Uh, this year, we'll have five, and, and two of those Two of those are specifically uh, to, uh, to clean lice. So we, we do uh, acknowledge what's happened in the past and we're all working collaboratively together and as individual com companies going forward uh, to improve on a day-to-day -day basis. Mike, do you want to follow that up? And I'll probably bring Scott in then to give you a warning that you're coming now. Yeah. The Environment Committee was very critical of the regulators. And in fact, I think it was Grant that said, you've got five licences and different regulatory bodies and often there was a danger of falling between that's what you actually said the different regulators and when we had CEPA and the, the, the committee was very critical of CEPA in, 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 in particular but others as well in that they were seemed to be doing their regulation in silos and we had as I say other evidence from other witnesses saying they thought the industry was self-regulating because once you've got your permissions you're regulating yourselves so that's the evidence that we've received. How would you comment on, what would you like to comment on that evidence? Yeah, ben, do you want to go on? Uh, sorry, no, I said Scott first. Do you want to go first, Scott, and then, then yeah. bring Ben in? Okay. Uh, I, think, I think the criticism of the regulators is a bit harsh. I think the regulators do a, a tough job. Uh, they, they do it to the best of their ability. I think the, the, the big change, in, in, uh, in particular in the last 24 months, is... Uh, is improvement in modelling and predictability as to what actually is the discharge from uh, marine farms. And, that, and we've been doing a lot of work collaboratively with SEPA on that. And we're about to come out, or it's actually arrived now, a new uh, DEPAMON model, which is the uh, model that uh, we, we basically uh, achieve our dis discharge consents based upon. And there's another regulation, dep depositional zonal regulation, that's again being modified in order to uh, more accurate, accurately predict what the impact, uh, what the benthic impact will be uh, uh, on the seabed, and that will be coupled with hydrodynamic modelling, which the, the companies are bringing in themselves, will undoubtedly enhance the, the accuracy of, of, of predict, prediction in what the fate of, of the discharge from the salmon farms will be. And that's been a big load of work, a big process that's been ongoing. It hasn't been done in a silo, it's been done in collaboration with SEPA. And it's, it, it, you know, there's a lot of learning going on, believe it or not, a lot going on behind the scenes to, to get to the next stage. Uh, now, I'm not a scientist. This guy next to me is. He can tell you a bit more technical detail on that. But it, it, in, in my opinion, it, actually, the regulators are doing a pretty, a pretty good job under fairly tight resources. Ben, in and then move on to the next question, which will be John Finney. So, well, okay, yeah, a follow up, maybe. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, I think it is a good question. And we, we shouldn't uh, downplay the, the strength of the regulation here in Scotland. It, it's good and it's better than that that exists in many other uh, salmon farming regions. How, however, it, in points it can be disjointed and there is more work to be done to bring it together, to get a strategy perhaps more like uh, what, what uh, Richard Lyle uh, suggested, that someone could take a view of the whole of the industry and say, okay, where do we want to go? You know, we've got a product here which has huge demand for it, which in terms of CO2 production is one of the lowest mainstream protein uh, sectors in terms of CO2 emissions. It's like, you want the figures, it's 2.9 kilos, uh, 2.9 kilos of CO2 for one kilo of salmon, and beef is in excess of 30. So we've got a product that everybody wants and it's good for the environment to farm it, it's very efficient. So there needs to be a more, uh, cultural support within Scotland for what we have and how to do it in the best possible way. And then say, okay, we want more farms, but we want better environmental KPIs. And how do we get those two things together? So we want higher farming production, higher value for it. We want the carbon footprint to continue to go down. We want lice levels to go down, all the issues that we'll touch on. Those improvements need to take place, but fundamentally we want the issue to uh, the industry to grow and where is the best places for that growth. And, and there's Mike. an opportunity, I think, through consolidation uh, of, the f of the farming areas. Just briefly, because I wonder, because it is evidence that we have received which you haven't addressed. Um, there are five different regulators. Once you've got your licences, once you've got them, when you're going through that process, and you're up and running, 
the evidence is that you are largely self-regulating. Would you agree with that statement or not? Um, I would agree with that statement in that all the companies are very professional and responsible and they utilise the environment to sustainably, sustainably reprocess the waste. So if you, if, you, if you're cavalier with that, then you as the company are punished the quickest and the hardest. But the regulation, it sets out what you can do in terms of discharge, in terms of pen uh, size, in terms of nets and where you can operate. So the, the, the regulation is, is structured. What I'm suggesting is that, and it has improved in the last two years, but there isn't a, a holistic overarching <coughs> strategy within Scotland as how this industry should move further. And I think maybe, maybe Stuart's best place to, to stay to that, because to talk about that, because the industry leadership group and the, the activity of the government to try and spearhead that and, and tick all the boxes as you, as you grow this business it is a good starting point. Okay. Um, okay. John Finney, I think yours is the next question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Neil Convener, and, and good morning, panel, and thanks for your submissions. Um, it, part, it's been part touched on, um, but not. Uh, I, I want to go a bit further into that, and that is the issue of mortality. Now, accepting that with livestock production, there's always an, an element of uh, mortality. And since you've already answered the question I was going to ask initially, uh, clearly you're not, ex you're not uh, content with the level of fish mortality at the moment. Is there an acceptable level? Is there a benchmark you're working to as regards fish mortality? Um, ben, uh, you, I, I don't want to give you all the answers, but I mean, why don't you start it off and then see if we could bring in Grant and, and Craig on that, because I'm sure you'll have slightly different views. Ben? I, I can just give you my observation from working in the industry in a scientific and farming capacity for, for 18 years. If, you, if you're farming in, in the seawater stage, which lasts... Uh, around 18 months, 20 months, and, and you're sub 5% mortality, then you're amongst best in class. I mean, you have to remember that the, the, the life strategy of a salmon is to lay thousands of eggs, and very few of those survive. Um, the, the levels have gone up, and nobody's satisfied with that, and the, the focus and resources being brought to bear on it is, is intense. Um, but there are other industries with uh, mortality higher than what we have, and they're not singled out for, for such criticism or, on words like unacceptable. Now, we agree it's bad, and we agree it needs to be uh, resourced and fixed quickly. But, you know, the, the level of dairy herd replacement is, is around 35%. Uh, the mortality in the bass and bream sector in the Mediterranean... Yep. Uh, your industry that we're looking at at the moment. That's the, um, so I, whilst comparators might be appropriate, is there an acceptable level? Is there a target you're working to? We, we are most financially affected uh, when mortality is high and we gain from it when mortality is low. So the target that we're working to is zero mortality uh, in, in the sea. And that's what all the professionals in, in my company are, are aimed for. Um, as I said to you before, we, we did have kind of within the marine harvest group, which is, is represented in almost all the main farming regions, we had the, the, the lowest uh, level of mortality in the period from 2008 to 2012. <coughs> uh, mortality has risen significantly in Ireland. It's risen significantly in Norway. It's due to the factors that I described before. And uh, I, I do believe that the measures which are now starting to mature will see mortality decrease in, in the coming years. Craig, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, mortalities are, are, are a serious issue in the last several years has, has been uh, very bad and, and there's been improvements uh, in, implemented and in new areas of, of not just technology, but we're using fresh water. We're using, you know, our ships are full of fresh water to, to clean the fish, to help with the gill disease, to help them out. Uh, five years ago it was AGD, now we've got complex gill disease. Uh, cardiovascular problems with fish uh, and, and new issues. Uh, we all employ veterinaries and, and have biology departments to investigate as quickly as possible to, to sample fish every day to make sure that they're healthy because mortality is something we want zero of and when, when we have it, 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 it's not good. And it's, it's a, again, we, we want to have a, a low, uh, as, as low a, a mortality rate as possible. And we're doing an awful, awful lot to try to improve it uh, but we'll never be satisfied until we get zero. If that's possible, that would be great, but if not, then we'll, we'll carry on trying. 
Grant, I feel you probably may echo what Craig is saying. So maybe if John asks the, a supplementary, you'll be able to answer that as well. Yes, indeed. Thank, and thank you for these replies. And, and it is to quote from the Eclair Committee report, um, and specifically this quote, if I may, please. The overall number of deaths as a result of disease, ill health and stress may be masked by the early harvesting of fish with disease and life-threatening conditions. Is that the case? And if so, how widespread is this practice? Grant, do you want to come in on that? Uh, yes, I'd, I guess, uh, if I give you a bit of my background, I mean, I'm quite new to the job of managing director, and my background was very much in salmon farming prior to that. So this is a subject very close to my heart. Like any farmer out there, we hate it if our stock are not healthy. It, welfare is our number one priority, just the same as any other form of agriculture. And yes, if our fish are not healthy, we will look at the possibility of harvesting them. Um, I think that that's, uh, that's a better option than sometimes than it is to treat. So yes, if you left all fish in the sea and never harvested them, eventually all fish would die. So yes, there's been early harvesting. If we hadn't harvested early, the mortality rates could have been even higher. But then I don't think it's a bad thing to have taken that action and harvested earlier. It's with the other producers, is that? Who else would like, if anyone else would like to come in, I'm sort of looking at you. Ben, do you want to come in? Okay, Ben and then Craig. I think it, it does occur if, if you feel that the, the fish health situation is poor and uh, we have a, a legal and a moral responsibility to keep welfare of our stock uh, high, then a decision can be taken to harvest the fish out. So. Craig, do you want to come yeah, in? We, we take the decision very serious as well and take advice from a third party, third party veterinary group who come in and give us advice. And, and if the fish, fish's health is deteriorated so much, uh, then we will then take that decision to harvest, but it's, it's a serious decision, it's not taken lightly. I suppose the telling word in that quote that I read out was the, the word mask. Um, I don't know how you would react to that, is it? Is this all open and transparent, or is this avoiding a wider issue, exposure to a wider issue? Ben? Personally, I think it's a, it's a if you forgive me, it's a bad choice of word. Um, we we are very knowledgeable about the health status of our fish and the challenges that we have, and it's part of our business to be top of our game in that. Um, we're also very, very busy people, and one thing which I can accept that we've done badly is communicated this in an open and, and transparent way. It, sometimes it's complex information, and you've got to explain it. So what the SSPO has done to uh, publish the, the sea lice data uh, recently, and what it proposes to do to publish the mortality data, uh, what Marine Harvest has been publishing all this data by site since 2016. I, I think that's just where this industry needs to go to get a, a, a proper buy-in culture for growth in, in the right set of circumstances for quality growth as, as a nation. And uh, yeah, I hope that's a good answer, but uh, I don't think the word mask was, was, was appropriate, if I'm honest, in the, in the report. John, do you want to...? Uh, no, no, th thank you very much for the, these replies. Thank you. Commissioner. Okay. Um, the next question is Peter. Thanks, convener, and uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, mine and my background is, is farming as well, and we have a, you know, you'll be well aware of the saying in, in agricultural circles that where you've got livestock, you will have dead stock. It's a fact of life, and, and you know, we, we all try and minimise it, but it's there and will always be there, I believe. One of the reasons that the, the mortality in the, the salmon industry has risen lately is because of amoebic gill disease. Um, and, you know, you're, you're all trying to tackle that as well as you can, I'm sure. But my question about that is, what is your view on the risk of that, of these various diseases, not just particularly that disease, but any disease in, in farm salmon uh, being transmitted to the wild stocks? Is there a real risk that, that, you know, disease problems that you may have on your farms are, are transmitting to the, wild, to the wild fish out there? Looks like Ben, as the scientist, you're going to you're going to be answering that. If I just say that, just again, it's disease. Sea lice will will come to in a minute. Okay, so you mentioned amoebic gill disease, and that really came into Scotland in 2011 due due to warmer waters, and then it's ubiquitous through the environment. So, you know, when when farm fish go to sea, they don't have amoebic gill disease, and and we take out all the steps we can to screen them and make sure that they're disease free when, when they go to sea. And to pick up on uh, Mr Finney's point, if, if fish were diseased, we may take the decision not to put them to sea. You know, so there's those level of controls. 
Um, but it's an open environment, so when, when our fish go to sea, they can be infected uh, by wild fish, and then there is the potential for those diseases to be magnified within the environment because we've got a large number of fish in a given area. Um, that needs to be understood to a greater extent. It needs to be risk managed. Um, but what we also see on, on from a farming point of view is it, it's very difficult to have disease transfer from pen to pen. So, you know, if you've got a disease which won't jump from pen to pen and it's 20, 30 metres apart, then the given dilution within a lock system, within an area of open ocean for fish swimming, wild fish swimming by is, is, is much lower. Uh, but again, you know, be, being humble and, and taking it seriously, it, it is an issue, it needs more research and then the industry needs to be very transparent about the steps that it's taking to minimise the risk. I mean, you're, actually, you're, you're almost saying it's the other way around. I mean, the, the fish go to sea without the AGD, and the, the, somewhere along the line, the, 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 the start showing signs of AGD. So that must have come from the, way, the wider, the wider the ocean, if you like. Well, well, that is the case. But you know, the, the concern, I guess, from the, the wild fish sector, and we I speak to them quite a bit, and, and they, they, they voice those concerns regularly, is this magnification potential. That, that, that farms have mm. um, and that's something that you know you need to accept that that's a reality and as, as, a, as a leader of a company or working within the industry and, and just be clear about what you're doing to minimize the, the, the risk. Sorry, can I just, uh, just ask on that, I mean the wild fish aren't always around the pens, they, they, they're not lurking there, they're there at critical times of the year. Could you maybe just explain a wee bit if you think there's a way of minimising exposure to both by, by timing of, of stocking and, and timing of harvesting? Yeah, that, that has been done for, for quite some time, uh, where we have fallow periods within a farm to, to, make, to try and uh, reduce, have no fish, so that then you'll have no sea lice prior to wild small exodus from a river or migration from a river. Uh, from a disease point of view, what we do is we, the, the, there is a good level of working in the companies where a whole area, even if there's multiple companies, will come together and agree when it's going to be stocked, when it's going to be fallow, what would happen in the event that one company notifies a disease to share that information with a company and then work towards a common solution. Um, so our responsibility, I think, is, is transparency, to, to convey it honestly and, and it's technical, so in a, in a, in a straightforward way and then minimise any, any risk and hazard. And then what I would like to see more of is, is collaborative working with the wild fish groups uh, to, to actually uh, address the issues there. That, that, that's, that, that's something that should be mined much harder in my, my view. Peter, do you want to? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I wonder, does if, if Greg any, anything to add to that? Are, are you of the same opinion? The, the, the same opinion. Uh, we work as, a, as an industry uh, collectively, marine harvest and Scottish sea farms share some sea locks. We uh, uh, share information. Uh, we we follow at the same time uh, for an improvement overall. And we talk to our neighbours and, and we make sure as much as possible that, that we, we do that. And But in the future, with the, the, the more transparency, which all companies have, have signed up to and agreed to, again, we want to keep on improving that and making it better. And, and totally with the Wild uh, uh, Salmon Trout Association and, and all associations, absolutely have a more collaboration, more research, and we support that. Just to move on, uh, there's a new framework being developed, we're told, a farmed fish health framework uh, being developed by industry in partnership with the Scottish Government. Is this, is this a voluntary framework or, is, or will it have a statutory basis? And, and what do you think it will achieve as, as regards the uh, health for the for the whole industry. Who, ben, looks like you again. Yeah, I suppose I should. I'm co-chair co of that group, so <laughs> I don't need to. Um, just because mortality and, and, and growth and the perform the biological performance. You know, if you run a salmon business, that that's that's the core. That's everything about your profitability. So the point I'm making there is really. In this period where we've had a tough time and things have been difficult, vast resources have been thrown at, at the issue and a lot of innovation. So the Farm Fish Health Working Group was then saying, okay, if government, 
um, scientists and regulators all sat down and decided what steps could be added on top of that to, to go further? What, what would it look like? So the discussion there has been about uh, improving transparency, improving uh, communication flow, and then work streams related to understanding amoebic gill disease more, understanding gill health, uh, understanding how sea lice uh, move around farms, how the farms are connected, and then informing what the industry should do in partnership with government and uh, with regulators and also what changes to the regulation could be made to, to get the environmental KPIs in salmon farming developing quicker in the right ways. Does that, I hope that answers your question. And I mean, is that, is that going to be a, a voluntary framework or will it, will it have a statutory role as well? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, you're still, working, you're still working the framework up as I understand and it's likely to become more, uh, more transparent where you've got to shortly, I believe. Um, <clears throat> can you just comment on that? Yeah, so if you boil it down to, to its core, there are around 20 recommendations to improve regulation and co-working um, beyond what the industry is already doing. And so that then comes in and, and needs to be worked on over, over the next 10 years, you know, because it, 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 it takes that length of time. Um, I, I personally think it, it's very good. It's predominantly going to be voluntary because we, we all want healthier fish and we all want f better growing fish. Uh, but where it's needed and, and it's not being achieved voluntarily, then I would imagine it will move into regulation and policy within the regulators. Jamie, you wanted to come in briefly. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's briefly on the point of um, uh, notifications or alerts when a producer discovers uh, a disease in other forms of agricultural farming, there are very strict mechanisms in place through environmental protection agencies, etc., um, to notify other local farms and certain uh, protocols are put into place when diseases are discovered. What statutory uh, or mandatory procedures do you have to go through when you discover something on a salmon farm? And do you think there's been a cultural shift away from not wanting to say that I'm the root cause of a problem or that we have a problem to a more transparent way of letting the wider environment know that there are agricultural issues. Um, who'd like to, Ben, you, you seem to volunteer for all the, all the difficult questions. So, Ben, if I could, it, it, I mean, I'm mindful there's a lot of questions to get through, so it, yeah. if you could answer that shortly, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I'll try and do it shortly. So, so we, we have the same uh, <laughs> statutory requirement for notifiable diseases that you find in agriculture. So things like uh, infectious salmon anemia, uh, we would have a, a lawful requirement to notify when you had a positive on the site. Um, what we are pushing for as an industry and through the fish health frame, farm fish health working group is that we have, you know, kind of a gold standard transparency where all diseases, all lice levels by farm are published and out, out there. And I think that's a cultural shift that we need to make. And, and it's been difficult. And, and I can explain why it's been difficult fairly uh, quickly, because we're often attacked con constantly for these things. And so what we've, what we've matured in the thinking to is put all this information out there, be open about the problem, be open about what we're doing to address it, have the debate, uh, and try and foster a greater culture for managing uh, the, these disease challenges. OK. Um the next issue we're going to move on to is sea lice, and, uh, and I, I'd be very grateful if somebody could explain the position on sea lice and the publication of data, because I think it's fundamentally changed, or well, the position's changed since the Eclair Committee reported, and we have had some correspondence. Scott, is that something that you would feel comfortable doing so we understand where the industry as a whole is going on sea lice? Uh, yes, um, I'll try. Uh, Basically, the, the SSPO has been reporting uh, average sea lice numbers on a 30 area basis for a number of years now, and that's out in the public domain. It's on our, our website, uh, published on a quarterly basis, uh, based upon the uh, f um, fisheries board areas uh, in, in order to uh, get some ana analysis of, of what our sea lice performance has been. But we've taken it to a, a more granular uh, 
reporting base now. Uh, it's, it's been quite difficult to uh, ensure that we're getting the absolutely accurate information. There's no point in putting information out that then has to be withdrawn and re reset. But uh, as of, um, well, I think uh, some of you have received a copy already, but as of today, we've got on our website um, a farm site by farm site uh, sea lice uh, report. Um, which uh, is, uh, there's a three month lag, but there's a reason for that. Again, it's to ensure that we have the right data and it's, and it's uh, checked and double checked to ensure it's, it's accurate. Uh, and that will be produced uh, on a monthly basis with a three month lag per farm site. And that is as from now. Uh, and it will be on our website. It will also be sent in advance to uh, Marine Scotland scientists. Marine Scotland scientists, by the way, are still very keen to uh, receive the area report, which, uh, believe it or not, they think tells them more as far from an <coughs> analytical point of view. And, uh, and, and that's basically wh where we are with sea lice reporting. I mean, it, it's quite interesting in the sense that, uh, and I, I don't want to hold Norway out as, uh, uh, as the best model always, but you can actually go onto a website and click on a farm and get a report of that farm on anything to do with that farm. Say, I've got one in front of me and I'm not even going to pronounce, try and pronounce the name of the farm. You know, I've got 0.12 female lice per fish. I've got all the details on the back of lice per fish, medical treatments carried out, mechanical movements of lice carried out, uh, sea temperature, any fish disease and any escape incidents. And, and, it, and it's pretty forthright or clear to me. And they managed to... We did this yesterday, or the, the spice clocks did it for us yesterday, and, and came out with um, the 16th to the 22nd of April, which is not three months. It's, it's barely two weeks, and they seem to be fairly accurate. Would you say that's where you want to be? Ben, you're bound to agree, because your company is probably the one that, who owns this farm. But, but maybe, Scott, would you, would you think that's good practice, and would you like to see it going to that level? I think... I th a lot of the information that is on there uh, actually is in the public domain from Scottish On a farm by farm basis. On a, on a farm by farm basis, you can. On a one click start. Scotland's agriculture website, SEPA uh, report on the cast data. A lot of it is there. But I take your point that to, to, to be in nearer time, if you like, uh, to what, what the actual performance is, yes, that would be. Uh, I think a, a, a good step, but it requires a lot of resource to do that. And I, I think it's, it's, it's one step at a time. This has been a very considered step to get to where we are uh, with regard to our reporting. And, and we, we are going to keep enhancing it, there's no doubt about it. So Ben, you're, you're obviously going to tell me it's excellent because it, I, I won't say it's a marine harvest farm, but... Well, f firstly, I mean, I'm, I'm very impressed that you managed to get that information off uh, the website because it has a nasty habit of uh, being available in English and then reverting into Norwegian. Uh, but it's it, definitely it, English. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm impressed. But it, but it is a good website, and I think, yes, that, that's where we would like to get to, and the steps that have been taken uh, recently uh, emulate that. It is one area where Norway is, is, is better than Scotland. And, and there are, I can assure you there are many areas where Scotland is better than Norway. I mean, lived there and, and worked there for, for some years. What Norway also has is a kind of more supportive culture about marine farming and, and, and using the sea generally. You know, and, 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 it, and it's ingrained within their culture, right from access to fishing to, to farming. So to go directly to the question, if we have full disclosure like that and unfair not science, criticism which goes beyond evidence, which we have quite a lot of in Scotland, then, then it, it, it's not something that we, we would want. The ideal would be that the industry moves forward and, and mirrors that level of uh, granularity with its publications, and we all come together and we develop a, a solution-focused culture about developing this industry in a sustainable way. And, and I would strongly advocate that that's the right way to go. Right, I'm going to actually, well, I'm going to part that there because there are a series of questions that lead on for that and, and, and it's right that other committees co uh, members come in. So, Colin, if you'd like to lead that, off. Thanks, Camille. Just, just following on from, from the questions on the publication of data uh, on sea lice and also mortality, would you have any objections to um, making the publication of that data for all salmon farms compulsory in Scotland? Stuart, I'm going to let you come in. 
<laughs> just, just a small point. I have something uh, which I could maybe contribute to this, maybe more difficult for, for producers to, to mention in case it would appear defensive. But I think Ben touched on the subject of, of you know, Norway having a much more pragmatic uh, um, evaluation of, of you know, use of the marine environment. And the risk that I see uh, with, with right up to date, full disclosure of data, is malicious uh, attacks uh, coming on, on a commercial basis, and even I've seen some evidence of down to, to personal levels of, of attack round about the data. So I think we need to be aware of that, that risk uh, when, when and if we make decisions round about the, the, um, uh, you know, what, what we're disclosing and, and perhaps particularly when. Grant, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I, I think um, in an ideal world it would be voluntary, but I think if uh, there was a feeling that the voluntary information wasn't suitable, then and uh, the MSPs decided regulation was the way to go, that would be okay. Um, Colin, you've got a series of questions. Sure. Maybe we, if you could feed the next few in, maybe yeah. we can get everyone to get a chance to answer. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a number of questions there about regulation and, and other things. We've obviously touched on... Uh, first of all, the, the impact that, that, that sea lice on farm fish can have or on wild fish. Uh, but I'm keen to know to what extent is that issue taken into account by the work that you actually do in terms of planning your, your, your farms? Or is that something that, you, that is really important and a key issue for you? Or is it somebody else's uh, priority? And if so, whose? OK. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just slightly distracted there. Who would like to, to head off on that? I slightly missed that. Ben, do you want to come in and then I'll try and bring Stuart in as well? Ben. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's a very key issue. We take it very seriously. So the, the primary action that we take is to minimise any discharge of farm-derived lice during the sensitive period for, for wild smolts when, when they're exiting sea locks. Um, our own policy for expansion is in areas away from rivers, uh, so we, our expansion has been predominantly on, on the Western Isles and the Small Isles, like uh, on Barra and, and Mock and Rum, where, where you don't have uh, high concentrations of, of uh, wild fish, so it's high up there. Stuart, do you want to come in? Um, I've read uh, a book that Martin Jeff has produced on uh, uh, wild sea trout, a different salmonoid, but essentially in the same... Uh, same territory. And he just basically draws research from all over the place. He's not doing research himself. There is one in particular that he quotes, which is Loch Carden, where there's three rivers, there's a, a farm. The farm, but the river that's adjacent to the farm has seen no reduction in sea trout, but the rivers that are distant from the farm in Loch Carden have. And he posits, but does not conclude, that there are quite a wide variety of interactions with the wild sea trout and the environment, reduced salinity, warmer waters, and lice. Is that a piece of evidence that he brings forward in his book from elsewhere, something that you associate with, that yes, lice is a problem, but this ain't just about lice? The, the, the future health of uh, wild salmon or populations. Um, Grant, and, and, and could, could I maybe encourage you just to, to help the committee, is if you think there's a difference between salmon and sea trout uh, and the effects of, of lice on either of them, if there is a clear def difference, you might like to mention it. If you don't think it, don't mention it, Grant. Um, there is a difference between sea trout and salmon, and I'm not an expert in this field, but my understanding is salmon will run out of the rivers and then will tend to go to deep sea. So they have to pass the salmon farm, but are not necessarily there for a long period of time. Whereas with sea trout, they, they live much more locally, so they may come into contact with sea farms on a more regular basis. Um, I think that there's no question there's a huge number of issues facing our wild salmon populations, uh, not just in the UK, but right across Europe. Um, sea lice is one of them, and I think that there's no question that sea lice are bad for farm fish and they're bad for wild fish, and we have to do everything we can as an industry to make sure that our sea lice numbers are at the minimum. But it is important to note that um, salmonids uh, are 
struggling in areas where there is no um, farmed salmon as well. So particularly in the southern regions, so in England, in Wales, in France, uh, salmon populations or salmonids, uh, sea trout as well, are, are suffering much worse than they are in Scotland and Norway, which obviously have much more in the way of, of sea farming. So that's not to say that there's not a connection between um, mortalities in, in particularly sea trout and, and farmed salmon. There may well be, and we need to do everything we can to bring that down, but it's clearly not the only thing that's at play here. Ben, do you want to come in on that? And then Craig, uh, I'm very happy to bring you in on that as well. Yeah, I think we, we as, as a company, and I think increasingly as an industry, we, we start off with the view that um, excessive levels of farm-derived lice retained within a sea lock or a, an area of contained water body poses a hazard. To, to wild fish, and, and it could uh, put additional strains on them. Um, now, salmon and sea trout are different. Uh, you know, the, the sea trout smolts are generally larger, but they spend more time in coastal waters, so the, the exposure to that hazard will, will, will be different. Um, what I suggest is, is the way forward for, for the industry is, is you know, a gold standard of transparency. Um, and then to minimise the, the lice levels and, and the farming presence in, in sensitive areas over time. So to have growth in, in areas away from uh, migratory fish systems. I think what we suffer from here in Scotland is a, is a, is a continual overstatement about the effect that uh, farm-derived lice have on wild fish. And it's, it's important not to in my view, overreact to that. Um, salmon and sea trout are under pressure due to climatic factors, due to higher levels of predation, um, due, due to many, many things. And to then say that the West Coast, is, is, is it, the primary impact is coming from, uh, from salmon aquaculture, I don't believe that's correct. But, but we are utilising a shared space and we are having the environment assimilate our waste and we are, especially over you know, the period 13, 14, and 15, we, we did have a higher burden of sea lice on some farms. And so I think then it's incumbent on the industry to address that problem, work with the wild fish, minimize the hazard, and try and research the scale of the effect. But still, very important not to overstate it. C Colin, do you want to come in with any of the other questions? I will bring you in, Craig. It's just a question of trying to get a few questions there on the table as well. I'm keen to know what the, what the driver, therefore, is. Um, if you say it's not as big an issue as some people may suggest, what is the driver for the action that's being taken by the industry? I mean, first of all, do you think the industry is doing enough to tackle the problem of sea lice? To what extent have, um, has the practice uh, been impacted by Marine Scotland's new um, sea lice regulations? And what further regulation do you think needs to happen to, to, to drive that work forward? Craig, do you want to come in on that? Uh, and I, Stuart, I know you're keen to come in, and Ben, I, I guess you want to come back on that as well. So, Craig, Stuart, and then Ben. Yeah, uh, SSC have uh, invested heavily in, in, in research and training in new ships uh, and, and to better understand exactly what's happening with, with sea lice, uh, how to, to clean them, how to keep, it, keep the fish healthy with, with minimum handling. Every time you handle a fish, it, it can, it can affect the, 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 the salmon. Uh, and of course, w when we clean and we work in, in farm management areas and having uh, larger cages in, in specific areas, that helps as well through, through proper planning. So as an industry and as a company, we're certainly looking into that. And as I said earlier, it's not a matter of spending money. We spend an, an awful lot of money now. Uh, and it's money well spent. And it's, it's money for the future that we want to go further to better understand and, and to clean the fish and to find that lice are a worldwide phenomenon at the moment and, and they've been there for, for uh, thousands of years uh, and we're only now on that learning curve. So we're going through a progression of improvements that, that we don't want to stop as a company and as an industry. Stuart, do you want to come in and then I'll come to you, Ben. Yeah, if I might do, I think Colin, the premise of the, of the question was round about uh, um, the effect of sea lice on, on wild fish. but. You know, I'm not a scientist, but I've been closely involved in this industry and the fishing industry for 35 years. And, you know, we had very strong um, 
uh, aggressive commercial fisheries of, of salmon for years uh, in waters around uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland. We um, have recorded issues of ducks, for example, taking large amounts of smolts coming down the, down uh, downstream, returning to sea. Um, we have exploding, in some cases, seal populations in, in various areas around, around the country. We have climate change. We have huge growth in pelagic stocks, which are, are feeding off similar, similar feed as, as uh, salmon sea might have been uh, f feeding from. So the point I'm making is there are very large amounts of, uh, there is a large amount of other reasons which may be contributing towards reduction in wild fish numbers over long periods of time. And of course, what we need is some science around about that. We need to study all of these causes on an equal basis. Ben. Yeah, well, of course, I recognise all the things that Stuart said in terms of pressures on wild fish. But, you know, our responsibility as a, as a major industry in Scotland, which could have a hazard to wild fish, is to minimise that hazard and communicate how we do it. So. We, we have a situation where the production plan reflects the needs of the farmed fish, but also any potential hazards on wild fish. We have a lice management plan, which has moved more from a medicinal strategy into a mixture, a holistic strategy, including biological controls with cleaner fish, uh, fresh water treatments, uh, in some cases shorter cycles with larger smolts, and, and that's geared towards lice minimization. So, Ultimately, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that it's there, it's present in how you manage a fish farm operation. Um, where I would like to see it develop further is actually being definitive about the level of impact on wild fish. And, and that takes quite a lot of energy and research, and the industry should take part in that and, and, and support that, both uh, technically and financially, in my view. And then it would be good to end up at a, at a situation where salmon aquaculture provides more of the solution than the hazard. So working together on, you know, salmon is an iconic species for Scotland, both farmed and wild. And, and we have a duty, I believe, to, to work with the, the wild sector to, to make sure that it's as healthy as possible. So more projects on habitat uh, enhancement, restoration, etc. Colin, do you want to come back to all? Interesting points here on the need for research and, and, and some of that collaborative work. Is there a need for any changes to the way in which um, tackling sea lice is actually regulated at the moment? We touched on regulation earlier uh, and suggested that there should be some changes. Is there a need for changes in, in the way it's regulated to tackle the issue of sea lice, do you think? Just mindful of the time, I'm very happy to let somebody, one person, uh, come in there and, and grant. I think one area that would be very interesting to explore in that field is integrated pest management. Uh, that's been something that has really pushed our sea lice figures down over this last year, is using a number of factors and not just relying too much on medicines. Our medicine usage has gone down, and a number of alternative methods of either reducing settlement or, or dealing with sea lice where on, once they're on the fish have come. Have, we've made a lot of progress. So, I mean, maybe there is a, a role to look at how we manage to integrate pest management into the regulations. I think it's important that it doesn't become too hard and fast. It would be easy to say you must do X, Y and Z, but maybe as time moves on, A, B and C will be better options. But I think it's, it's maybe not a bad idea if uh, regulation is looking at integrated pest management. Mm. Just a quick question before we move on from that. Norway has lower lice, female lice limits per fish uh, targets before treatment than, than Scotland. I think I'm right in saying that. Is that, is, is that right? Do you think that, there's, that their levels are an aspiration we should be seeking to achieve? Ben, you can do a yes or no if you like. Uh, yes, I think we, we should seek to achieve those, but Norway is colder, you know, so yeah. it's harder to control ice in Scotland and it's harder control to control ice in Ireland than it is Scotland. Um, these are very arbitrary targets and people get fixated with them. You know, the, the, the one target which is acceptable in, in, a, in a one water body is not acceptable in another water body. So I think it's more collaborative research required between the parties. Okay, not quite a yes or no answer then. Um, I, I, Grant, I'm really sorry. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I think Ben's given quite a good answer to, to that as for, uh, for all of you. I mean, Richard, I think you're the next question, so I'd like to push on with that. Yeah, um, 
The capture and beneficial use of waste. Um, basically, Ben, you did write to uh, Graeme Day uh, in regard to the, the Clare Committee report, which I am a, a member of that committee for my, um, basically. So, you know, the National Trust for Scotland, the NTS, quite properly was asked to give evidence to both the Clare and REC committee hearings. We felt, however, that some of the evidence did not engender fair comparisons or contextualised criticism. You're going to say, for instance, the comparison made in the most recent REC hearing by NTS between human sewage and discharge from salmon is misplaced. So, can I ask, why is it misplaced? And is it not correct that the volume of waste and untreated waste discharged from fish farms into the marine environment is half the volume of human treated effluent of Scotland, which I found quite disturbing? Who, who, oh, and you're it. Would you like to go on that? I'm sorry. You wrote the letter. <laughs> I'm, I should try and be a bit more patient. To tell me <laughs> May I go? Yes, please. Thank you. Mm. Um, yes, I wrote the letter. And it, it, what, what frustrated me with that is that it's an apples with pears comparison. And, and really, a body like that should, in my view, do a little bit better. Um, first of all, uh, sewage is treated because it contains faecal coal forms, which are harmful to humans. Fish are ectothermic, they are cold water species, they, they don't contain uh, faecal coliforms. Secondly, when people compare it to a sewage equivalent, they often choose to use phosphorus, and, and phosphorus is an issue when it's discharged into a freshwater environment in terms of eutrophication. It's not an issue generally when it's discharged into a marine environment. And so, you know, in, in summary, what we do in Scotland is very thoroughly and very scientifically through regulation with SEPA. We balance the discharge of waste from the farm relative to the assimilative capacity of the water column and the seabed beneath it, so that over time it's reprocessed and it's sustainable. And so coming out with kind of, in my view, really sensational headlines like that, I would argue that's a thing of the past. And, and, it, and it's a little bit about this culture that we discuss. You, you don't hear so much of that in Norway. People accept that if you use the marine environment to reprocess waste and you manage that in a good way, well then that, that's a good thing and that's, that's what happens in agriculture. They, they have that view about the sea and uh, yeah, I, I'm basically giving you my side of the, of the viewer. I hope that's acceptable. What are you doing to uh, capture and use this waste to reduce the environment impact or, or is it, as you contend, there is no impact? I'm, I'm very keen to bring bring in other uh, producers. So, I mean, Grant or Craig, if you if you want to come in on that. Um, sorry, Ben, I'm not trying to shut you out. Just to balance, Craig, Grant. Yeah, um, we're certainly looking at it. It's it's quite tricky technically to do, um, but we are interested in uh, removal of waste. The, really, the, what's limiting um, the, the sustainable size of a fish farm just now is the environment's ability to assimilate waste. So if we can remove waste, we can increase the environment's um, potential to hold more salmon, which then allows us to hit these markets. So it's something we want to look at. It's technically difficult, it's expensive, it's very energy intensive, but it's not impossible. And I, I, we've been looking at this recently for sea sites. I don't think we're there yet to be able to make this work commercially, but I think as time moves on, that might well change. If we can recover the waste, it's not just that we can reduce the impact on the environment and then possibly produce more salmon, but also it could be a potential energy source for us as well. It's, it could be used in anaerobic digestion to produce biogases as well. So it's an area we're very interested in and we'll continue to monitor. Craig. Yeah, it's the same, and then she should collaborate with the Scottish Aquaculture Innovation uh, Centre as well uh, to look into this for collaborative research, uh, financial input, and, and put some serious effort into it uh, for the first time and, and actually start. So, yeah, it's, it's an area for a, a positive move that we can make as an industry. Ben. Uh, I want to ask this a quick question, then I'll let uh, other people in. Um, I noticed it was reported that share prices in salmon companies fell slightly due to Norway considering raising site tax. Norway either licenses or sells sites in their area. Can you, you know, just for the record, uh, and it's, I, I can't pass up asking you this, um, what tax do you pay in Norway and what do you pay in the UK? Um, uh, you may want to send us that information ben, if you don't can, have it. 
Uh, are you in a position to answer that? You might not be in a position to answer that, but I mean, you, you, you would be the only one, I think, that could. Yeah, I, I can answer that, I hope, reasonably well. Um, of course, we pay corporation tax in, in, in the UK, and uh, Norway pays corporation tax on its profits in, in Norway. Uh, when you buy a licence to operate a farm in Norway, that, that's purchased from the state. Uh, when you gain a licence to farm in Scotland, you pay a rental over time to the Crown Estate based on the tonnage which is taken from, from the site. Um, like Scotland and Norway, you have uh, community gain uh, where there is uh, some smaller payments paid into community funds, etc. And, so, and so that exists. Um, I hope that answers it. I'm saying that actually Norway makes more money from salmon farming than what Scotland does. And then I'll finish it now. No, that's not correct. No. no. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the next question then, if I may, which is uh, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, I want to talk about seals. Um, by 2022, there is a chance that we won't be able to export to the US because they're thinking about banning products from fish farms that continue to shoot seals. What are you doing to try and get shootings down to zero? Do you use um, acoustic deterrent devices? And if not, why not? And are there any other emerging technologies that we're seeing to try and reduce predation from seals? Uh, you're queuing up to answer Grant and then Craig. <laughs> Yes, uh, SEALS is uh, something that we've been working very hard on reducing our impact. Um, we've reduced the number of SEALS we shoot by 80% since 2011 when the licensing process came in and we are well on our way to reducing that to zero and we've been well on our way to that before the news from the US but I think that just adds urgency to this. We need to be reducing the number of SEALS we shoot down to zero not just because um, it allows us access to the US market but actually because it's the right thing for us to be doing. Um, we've worked very hard on this. If I take you back to 2011, Greek seafood didn't have a good record. We actually shot 23 seals on one farm, which is, wasn't acceptable. And since then, we've worked very, very hard at finding alternative ways to control that. And in, since January 2015, we've had to shoot one seal, which is still one too many in my uh, opinion, but we're working down to zero. I think that's the same for the whole industry. In terms of ways of stopping seal-salmon interactions, um, we've invested a lot in um, physical barriers. So a lot of different kinds of netting um, to try and prevent the seals from getting at our salmon. That's our first choice of barrier. We do use some acoustic deterrents um, where we find that the, it's necessary, but that is uh, the next step down. We don't want to do that. There is the potential for acoustic deterrents to interfere with um, other marine mammals. And so it's something we want to minimise as much as possible. But I think it's probably preferable to having to shoot a seal. Craig. Yeah, the Scottish Salmon Company aimed to get down to zero and we've been uh, gradually uh, deploying marksmen less and less. Uh, acoustic deterrents are very important, they're very effective. We use them in most of the sites where, where we have seals, predominantly on the, the, in the northwest, outer Hebrides, inner Hebrides, where in the last two years there, there are more and more uh, grey seals and common seals uh, appearing. Uh, and a thousand sometimes. Uh, we've got, I said, third generation uh, families working for us, and, and they've never seen so many seals in the Outer Hebrides as, as we get today. So it is, it is an issue, uh, and, and you know, dispatching a marksman is our last resort, and it's, ta it's taken very seriously. So acoustic detectors, uh, stronger nets, double netting sometimes, uh, and other ways. And again, more research into what else can we do to, to, tell, them to, to, to tell them to come, because we, we have to protect our livestock. I suppose the difficulty is once a, a seal gets into the into the net, how, how, how you solve that. Stuart, you wanted to come in. Just as a producer of acoustic deterrents, I think it's an excellent question, Gail. And uh, <laughs> I, therefore, I have to also declare my interest. No, I think I'll see. Ben, do you want a short answer on that? Yeah, no, the short answer is that we, we don't want it as an issue. You know, it, it's... it's uh, it's negative, it's embarrassing, it's not something that the, the industry is proud of, but we, we've got a legal requirement to, to protect our stock as well, and so we're in a, 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 there's a rock and a hard place element there. The, the levels have come down enormously, I think it's about an 80% reduction, 
Um, in terms of the way we manage the population, I think it's good now. The, there's a, a quota system so that you're not uh, reducing from any specific area uh, too much. And you know what, what was shot by the industry last year was something like 0.3% uh, of, of the population, or 0.3%. It's very low. Again, it, context is important here because you know, in 2017, the, the wild capture fishery sector recorded uh, 610 seals killed against the 48 killed by the aquaculture industry. You know, so while the industry battles and works hard to reduce its levels down to, to zero, it's important not to overly beat the, the farmed industry up when it is an issue for, for other sectors as well. Um, Craig, you talked about R&D and, and technology and how that's moving on. Is that research, will, would that be shared across the sector? Yes, we, we talk to the different companies through SEIC at the same time, and it's shared across the sector. Okay, thank you. Very briefly, Peter, and then I'm going to come to you. I'm, I'm just going to try and redress the balance a wee bit. I mean, I, I, I already said I'm a, my background's farming, and to, to suggest to a farmer that you couldn't shoot a fox would go down very badly indeed. But you folks, you guys are very focused on not shooting seals, and seals are far from an endangered species. There are thousands of them out there. Uh, I just... You know, I just wonder if we've got a wee bit too too hooked up on on not shooting, a, a, you know, any seals at all, given that that would go down very badly if that was transferred into the, into farming and you couldn't shoot uh, a fox, for instance. I just make a comment, Grant. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can understand, Peter, and I think it's. The level of shooting that we've got today is not an ecological problem. It's a, it's a reputational risk problem for us, though. Seals are uh, a very iconic species. Um, people come to Scotland to see the seals, and, and in some ways it's, it's nice that there's so many for them to see. Um, it's something that we need to do as an industry to get down to zero, I think. I think we're going to leave that one there uh, and move on uh, to you, Kate, with your questions. Great, thank you very much. I'd like to ask some questions on the Aquaculture Industry Leadership Group, which I believe Stuart Graham um, co-chairs. <laughs> and my understanding is that the main purpose is to drive the development and delivery of the Aquaculture 2030 um, industry strategy. How is the group held to account in terms of its status? Is it voluntary membership um, at the moment? And what kind of accountability do you think it should have, and to whom? Well, the, the leadership group is an industry leadership group, so the important part here is the industry have taken the lead uh, in this, uh, and we have, a, it, it's a very collaborative group, uh, and I think from the formative um, uh, co-chairs of the Vision 2030 group, which was a gentleman, Dennis Overton, uh, chairman of Aquascot, and I, um, we took an initiative without any authority uh, to invite stakeholders to a working group to formulate the, the strategy. And uh, we, we should, you know, this is quite a small industry and uh, we uh, took some soundings and from that we assembled what we thought was uh, a representative uh, group of the public and uh, private uh, stakeholders to produce that strategy. At the end of having produced the strategy, uh, we held, uh, again, from um, a database of industry contacts, we held an elective process, entirely voluntary, uh, to elect members of the industry leadership group there. We have very light touch, self-imposed governance, um, and uh, I uh, co-chair with uh, the managing director of Scottish Sea Farms, two-year overlapping processes, uh, uh, terms, I should say, and uh, in terms of being held to account, uh, <coughs> currently we are not held to account, uh, other than I guess by all of the stakeholders uh, round, round the table, and we're transparent, put meetings onto uh, website, meeting minutes and so on. So, yeah. There's been a, a lot of talk, and um, we heard it again last week, around partnership collaboration, mm -hmm. working with regulators, government um, and others in the hope that that might drive change and also support the industry. Do you think this would be the group to do that through? I mean, is there a role for a greater strategic oversight of the industry through this group? 
runs entirely with, with no dedicated uh, financial or administrative resources. So, so we all come to the table with the ability to take a work package on. Uh, I think it is the right place for a strategic uh, leadership of the industry, and that is what we, we do seek to do. Um, and I guess uh, you know, we've just had a review after one year of its existence, and um, you know, we, we felt around the table that it was working quite well, the process. I, I, I would like to comment, however, we've had a large amount of, of uh, public sector and government stakeholders round, round the table in this, and I think you know, the power of that collaboration has been absolutely remarkable, and, and I think something really to behold in terms of how quickly we were able to get things uh, moving and moving in the right direction. So it's a very interesting model, which we feel thus far, although it's, we're only one year, in has worked well. Well, and what are you talking about getting other stakeholders around the table? From your perspective, a lot of talk about reputational risk as well. Is this a group where what what do you want? What does the industry want through this group from government, from regulators, in order to be able to demonstrate that the industry is concerned with meeting relevant um, environmental? Uh, standards in light of the the desire to grow in a sustainable way, if that question makes sense. It's a bit waffly. Um, yeah, well, I, I think all of the right stakeholders are around the table to, to hold our, the industry to account in terms of delivering the strategy. The strategy is premised on sustainable growth uh, and an understanding that uh, in bio biology is the number one challenge. Um, so the, the group feels about right uh, f for me, and I think we're making good progress, and I think it's the right forum. Um, if, if we felt there were more people that could add value, then we could certainly look at that. But there's general guidance on industry leadership groups as a, a kind of optimum number, around about 12, which were, were there or thereabouts. So it, it feels to me like it's working, working well. Thank you very much. John, you've got a question, and then... That's a final one for me, John. Hey, thanks, Convener. Um, we've, we've touched on regulation already, so that, that's covered quite a lot of the ground. But when we were out on Monday, we were visiting in Loch Aber, as you may know, and we were told, somebody told us then, that the, they felt the regulatory system uh, had become less predictable than it used to be, and that um, whereas it used to be fairly clear that if you did certain things, your planning and everything else would be approved, there was a feeling in some circles now that they would go into the industry would go into a meeting despite having done what it thought it could do, but um, they still didn't know what the outcome would be, and it would very much depend on maybe which councillors turned up. We were given an example of a one in Loch Aber where the four local councillors turned up and opposed the, the, the application, but six outsider councillors. A, turned up and supported the application and overruled the local ones. Um, so on that, on that specific area, do you feel it, has it become less predictable over time or are there problems with that? Stuart. I think that's probably not an issue of regulation per se, more an issue of local democracy. And I doubt anybody, certainly nobody in the AILG uh, w would, uh, you know, be um, advocating the lack of local democracy. So I think uh, that, that uh, where you have different views of different councillors on any particular committee is simply a function of our democracy and it's a good thing and it's up to us in the industry to make sure that we inform uh, councillors uh, when, when decisions are to be made. Okay. Grant, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not, I think I would echo really what Stuart said. I think particularly with planning, we've now got a pre-application process, then we've got screening and scoping, then we've got the full planning application, which I think does give the industry a pretty good steer on whether or not an application is worth pursuing. There are always going to be some areas that are, as, as much as we try to make everything objective and scientifically based, are going to be slightly object, subjective. And there is always a risk that the decision goes a different way than you had imagined. But that, I think, is part of the game, and I think that also uh, allows a lot of local democracy, which is not a bad thing. OK. Um, I, I, one question at the end, which we, we shied away from, or I, I encourage you to shy away from, because I was hoping I might get a chance to answer it at the end, is that what, what's become evident, I think, to me during this inquiry is how much the industry has moved from where it was when, when it started. And, and a different knowledge base that the industry's developed. 
And, and it appears, and certainly from our visit over to uh, Lock Arbor last or well, earlier this week, was that there was some agreement that maybe some farms were located in areas where perhaps today it would be inappropriate to site those farms. And I've also heard during the evidence session that farms are limited by the amount of mass of fish that they can hold in it. And, and, and that's echoed, I think, from the, the evidence that we heard from the wild fish sector. So it's a sort of general question is that as industries moved on, whether it's location due to wild fish or due to uh, other fish or even to, I think it was marl beds that we heard about uh, in the Eclair Committee, do you think there is some scope for industry to reconsider the positioning of their farms to less uh, environmentally uh, maybe uh, sensitive areas to less environmentally sensitive areas, and part of that process to combine, maybe increase the size of those farms elsewhere to allow them to remove them from industry elsewhere. Now, Grant, you touched on that, and, and I think it, 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 it's important that all of you have a chance to answer that. Um, and I'm certainly gonna give you the chance to answer it all. So, Grant, would you like to answer that? Yeah, I think it's a process that's currently ongoing. Um, I mentioned earlier on, back in 2010, we were operating on 33 sites, now we're operating on 17. Most of those sites that we have chosen to shut down are relatively sheltered. And the reason that we're moving away from them is because, they, because they're sheltered, they have less ability to sustainably support a large amount of fish. Um, also, because they're sheltered, they tend to be areas that possibly you get worse sea lice issues in, you may get worse problems with, with gill health as well. And the other thing that has changed over time is, thanks to Stuart and, and the people in the supply industry, the level of equipment that's available is now much more robust than it was previously. So, as technology moves on, we're able to move out into more and more open waters. And I think that that's definitely something that should be being encouraged by regulation is the movement away from these inshore sites, freeing those up for other water users to use, and us moving offshore. Um, I think uh, the process with the, the Crown Estate, where, where we're um, essentially being charged for not using sites, is encouraging us to give up those sites. The same thing's now happening with SEPA. So we're not holding on to sites that can be freed up for other purposes. And I think a move out to bigger, deeper sites would be beneficial. The other thing is it might be worth um, looking at how marine spatial planning can help us to do that in terms of identifying areas that are perhaps more suitable for, for aquaculture, that this is where we want the industry to move to. Okay, Craig. The, the Scottish Salmon Company is, it was essentially made up of seven small farming companies put together and Lighthouse Caledonia was formed and from that Scottish Salmon uh, Company w was formed. And, and being small farmers, those farms were traditionally small in local areas and, and isolated so that the small farmer, his costs were down, their costs were down to, to, to look after the, the fish. So we, we, have, we had a lot of seven, 800 tonne sites, which today is, is minuscule. In Norway, there are five, six, 7,000 tonne sites. So what we've been doing is a process of moving and closing down these small, uh, smaller farms and with new applications already moving them out. Uh, Grenamol in, in the you know, in North Uist, which is pretty stormy, uh, and, and other areas. So yeah, we, we would support that and look at, look at moving away from our smaller sites as we've already started to do. Ben. Yeah, I think there's, there's real opportunity there to take down some of the conflicts that exist uh, with the various stakeholders in the industry, particularly between the industry and the wild fish sector. Um, I think it should be evidence-based. I think you can't come to a farm and say, I presume that it's having an impact and therefore it should be relocated. I think the evidence needs to be presented if that farm has been operating there for some time legally and in a good way. But one startling fact on the numbers is, you know, Norway produces around 1.2 million tonnes of salmon and it's got 250 active farms. We, we produce 170,000 tonnes, give or take, and we've got 207 active farms. So the farms are fundamentally smaller, and we've had a policy within SEPA which has kept the farms small. We've got farms which are 2,500 tonnes and, and sustainably could be five or 6,000 tonnes. If you did a consolidation activity to reduce the stakeholder issues and at the same time 
maintain the social benefits and the value and wealth that this industry creates within those areas, then you could take a real environmental gain from that. And really, although people have that in mind and many of the companies and regulators are working towards it, there isn't yet a single body within Scotland that's taken hold of that and said, okay, this is a way that we can have a step change within the industry and take this industry forward. Scott, you've probably been saving yourself from previous questions. Uh, I tend to agree with the, the comments made by the other members of the panel. Um, I think it's also important to uh, note that that really is a consideration of the AILG. Uh, that is part of the discussion, is how, how do we uh, move forward into greater, more exposed sites. And also Richard's earlier question about how we you know, had, had 160,000 tonnes in 2002 and we've got 177,000 now. I mean, that's fundamentally, we, we have been self-regulating. Uh, there are, I know of one company in west of Shetland that has got consent for 30,000 tonnes it's not using because it just feels it's too, uh, too much of a biological and environmental risk. So, you know, that, that's where we are and therefore in order to optimise the consent we could have, uh, then we should be moving to more appropriate sites. Thank you. Stuart? Yeah, if I might say, and characteristically perhaps just a note of caution on the use of words like offshore and open seas and, and, and such like, I think it's not perhaps very well understood but very easy to say that uh, farms should move offshore and to, to uh, more open sea environments. Um, you know, there are other issues and constraints round about uh, that. It's a harsh, it's a hostile environment, it's dangerous. We're talking about people also working there. Um, but also I think, and I would encourage the committee not to feel that this is, this is just a panacea. We must move offshore and bigger sites. That must be a progressive process which, while we do have much more robust uh, equipment nowadays, that needs to be a process of feeling our way and moving our way slowly forwards. It's not an unlock uh, and all of a sudden everything moves offshore. It's a difficult, challenging environment, not just for people, but also for fish, for containment, other environmental challenges that can come from that. So I would just want to add a note of caution to the, to the thinking round about that. Okay, Stuart, thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to thank all the witnesses, as I'm sure the committee would, for, for their input. Scott, Ben, Craig, Grant, Stuart, I hope you all feel you've had a chance to to say, say all you needed to. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and we're now going to move into private session. Uh, before we do so, we'll allow the witnesses to, to depart. So thank you very much. <laughs>